Good evening. Um, I'm going to get started and read my piece as people are coming in. Um, this open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all such meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access um, can be afforded and the public can follow along with the liberations of the meeting, ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law this meeting will feature public comment for this meeting the arlington school committee is convening by zoom as posted on the town's website please note this meeting is being recorded some attendees <coughs> excuse me are participating by video conference please be sure others please be aware others may be able to see you take care not to screen share your computer all of the materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard, we recommend members and the public follow the agenda as posted unless I note otherwise. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude, I will go down the list of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Um, all uh, votes taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. So let's make sure that we can all hear each other and do attendance. Ms. Exton. Here. Uh, Mr. Cardin is gonna be a couple of minutes late. Dr. Allison Ampey. Here. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Here. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Hainer. Here. Uh, Dr. Bodie. Here. Uh, Dr. McNeil. Here. Uh, Mr. Mason. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Can you hear us, Mr. Spiegel? Oh, perfect. We can't hear you, though, actually. Let's make this super hard. Sorry. <laughs> I'm here. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, I, yeah. I can see you, so. My mic isn't working on my laptop. I don't know what's going on. All right. Uh, Ms. Elmer. Here. Uh, Ms. Ferranti. Here. Thank you. Um, I see Ms. Sheridan Curran. I'm here. Perfect. We can hear you. Um, and I think that's it. OK. Um, so the first item on the agenda tonight is public comment. Uh, there was no public comment. Nobody signed up today by 3 p.m. Um, so we will move along to the next item, which is the COVID testing program update. So Dr. Bodhi, I'll let you start. And then um, I know that, uh, yeah. I'm happy to do that. Um, I don't think uh, uh, Sue Funky is here yet. Dr. Sue Funky, Susan, uh, but... Um, with me this evening to talk about our testing program is Cindy Sheridan Curran, who has many titles in our district, uh, but the one this year that is probably taking up more time than anything is our testing program. Um, I will let her give an overview of what we have been doing, but uh, I can't resist giving uh, some good news of our testing program this week that we had 385 staff members tested and we had zero positive cases. So that was quite, uh, I think, quite remarkable, not remarkable, but a change from last week. We were wondering whether we were gonna start seeing more of a surge uh, post the holidays. So um, as, uh, I think most people know from emails I have sent out that we have had a testing program in our district for staff members uh, since September. And uh, that, that testing program has been um, run by, uh, uh, by both Cindy Sheridan uh, Curran as well as our Director of Nursing, Susan Franke, who 
will be here probably momentarily. But at any rate, um, if I could at this point uh, ask um, Sheridan Curran to talk a little bit about the program that we've had, uh, which has changed over the, the semester and where we are today and what we're looking to be doing in the near future. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I've got a lot of information for you. So um, feel free to um, slow me down, jump in with questions. Um, I, I will try to um, make this as brief as possible, give you a clear idea of what's happened so far in our district. From September to um, present, we have done 3,625 tests. Um, of those, we've had 18 positives. In September and a few weeks in October, we were working with uh, Concentric uh, by Ginkgo BioWorks. Um, that was a saliva test that we um, rolled out that was we found to be more costly than the lower nasal swab test. Um, we worked with Armstrong and we had one week in October where we used both in different locations. Um, the Armstrong test was a little bit less costly and um, we had wonderful EMTs from Armstrong who really did a, a great job running the sites. Um, and Armstrong, has, as I'm sure everybody on this call knows, that Armstrong has always been a really strong community partner. So that was just easy. Um, so we had pretty, we had a, a pretty decent response. Um, every time we sent the registration out, reminders went out every week with the registration attached and additional reminders went out. So um, staff members were given um, the opportunity to access the test every week if they cho chose. Um, and we had several um, tests every single week. Uh, on average, you know, it was anywhere between, um, on average, I'd say about a bit, three, 325. Um, we would have larger numbers be right before or after those long weekends. Um, and again, our positivity rate last week seemed to have been an, an anomaly. It made for a very busy day on Tuesday. Um, as you can imagine, eight positives has a pretty um, major impact when you're talking about in-person staff. Um, of course, that was handled beautifully by the principals and nurses involved. Um, so here we are moving into next week. We're doing one more um, PCR individual testing for staff. All this testing um, since October has happened out of the high school. We use a pretty small footprint in the high school. So the traffic and the flow is, is nice um, and tight and we don't have people kind of wandering around the high school. Um, so there's plenty of room if we do have anybody, um, students in doing reverse field trips or, or what have you, there's no um, very low impact. We, several weeks ago, started looking at the realities of moving into 2021 and what that would mean in terms of finances. So several weeks ago, um, we started um, attending meetings and, and getting to know what districts across the Commonwealth were doing um, and pool testing com continued to come up, surveillance testing. And we thought, you know, we wanted to continue to offer staff a reliable weekly test um, we really had to look at the sustainability of the individual PCR tests that were quite costly um, once we got into 2021. Um, I met with the um, folks over at Concentric. They just opened a lab in the seaport. Um, they had a lab in New Jersey, which is where we were sending our um, kits in early fall. They have uh, a lot of, of um, like any new lab, they're trying to make things efficient and quick. Um, and so while I was discussing moving into pool testing with them, they started talking about a pilot program that they'd like to do. Um, and if we agreed to join the pilot program, we would be able to test at no cost. Um, so after a lot of conversation um, with other people, including Armstrong, about it, we decided we would move forward and, and see how we could roll this out. Um, so we decided that we would pilot pool testing in our classrooms. Um, so we started kind of planning for that and, and thinking about what that might look like um, over winter break. 
And as all of you know, um, after, after that, the uh, memo came out about the state pooling pilot. Um, we attended a meeting, a statewide meeting a couple days ago, and they talked about the pooling in classrooms um, and what their kind of design was. And they were requesting um, a survey to be filled out, which we did fill out if we were interested in participating in their pool, which doesn't, in their pilot program, which doesn't start until the end of January. Um, we are already involved in this pilot program, um, again, with Concentric. They have not been specific about who they will be contracting with. Um, it is likely that Concentric will be one of the people they're contracting with. They, they did um, hint around that there would be more than one contractor. So we have the infrastructure. Um, we're doing our own pilots now. So I'm hoping that we can move smoothly into the state pilot as well and continue um, testing both staff and now moving and expanding into testing um, students as well. So next week, um, we are going to do some pool testing at Thompson Elementary. We're going to test every single person who volunteers um, to be tested at Thompson. So every student will have the opportunity, every staff member. Um, again, just like our staff testing, this is optional. Um, so we are we're very careful in our language and inviting families to participate with us um, and making it clear that this is certainly voluntary. Um, the plan is to um, have a practice day. Um, Karen Donato is going to buy lots of Q-tips and have the children, some of the older children practice. This is a self-administered test. Now in the experience of um, the concentric um, employees, they have found that the districts doing this um, have done it with relative ease in terms of the self-administration. I, I think we all kind of get a little bit worried about um, giving our, some of our students um, swabs and telling them to do exactly what we always tell them not to do is stick something up their nose um, and do the self-administered tests. So we plan on practicing um, with those who are volunteering. We will have consent, so we'll, know, we'll identify exactly who will be involved. Um, the nurse at the Thompson will be um, very involved and in each classroom um, to be sure that the students who may not be able to do this will be identified and will be assisted. Um, and then of course the younger students will um, have the nurse do the swabs. Um, the swabs for the self-administer kit, I have props tonight. Um, these are the swabs that um, the students and staff would use for the pool testing. Now the pool testing, we will Tube. And this tube will be only labeled with um, either the teacher's name or we will, you know, we will put a room number on it or something and that is sent to the lab, along with the other tubes from the school. So the information, any identifying private information about our students, that is not um, provided to the lab, just the pool testing. The pool, the um, the pool testing is done in the lab. Once it's done and we get it back, if, if this tube comes back negative, we know that every single person who put a swab in here um, is COVID negative. If it comes back positive, of course, we've got to think about um, addressing the, um, that cohort in terms of reflex testing. Now, because we're doing the, the pilot at Thompson, we're going to offer reflex testing to anybody who participates. So our nurses all, um, Dr. Franke secured um, our, the Binex now, which I'm sure you've all heard about at this point. Um, every nurse's office has these. Again, um, it's a pretty simple procedure that the nurses do. Um, this is a card that is activated. And once the swab is put in the card and um, the test is done, it takes 15 minutes for the results to come in. Now, this is an antigen test. This is not a PCR test. And I know we've talked a lot about the gold standard being PCR. Um, this is, as, as our weeks into COVID have rolled on, the antigen tests have become highly accurate. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Franke can answer questions about, um, about the efficacy of, of these different tests for you. But we plan on, for the pilot, on doing the reflex testing on any student or staff who comes back if they're 
in a cohort of a tube that came back positive. Um, if the tube comes back positive in that cohort, that cohort then would, would have to pivot to remote learning um, for 10 days um, or, or come back on the 11th day. So whatever school days um, that, that would be within that time frame, they would have to, to be remote. Um, so that of course, from an operational standpoint, um, we've got some, um, we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that that goes smoothly. Um, but I, we're very fortunate to have gotten into this early pilot. Um, and it's, um, I think in terms of, uh, of Dr. Bodhi agreeing to do this, it's a, it's a courageous thing to do. There are many districts who I think are concerned about what this might mean for operations. Um, and not to mention, of course, then just rolling it out and doing the actual tests. So um, that is happening next week. So we're really excited about that. Um, I certainly won't give you all the details about what's going on. And there's certainly some that still need to be hammered out um, as, as the days go by, but we will be ready and prepared to um, test anybody who wants to be tested at Thompson Elementary next week. That's um, that all for you. Yeah, um, Dr. Franke didn't, uh, I just texted um, Ms. Fitzgerald to, send, to let her in. So uh, that's why she's not here. She's here. She is. Here, okay, great. Um, we also did uh, um, a trial run this week with teachers and overlapping both tests just so we could, uh, one, uh, take a look at the act, you know, what we're finding with the accuracy, which we expect to be very, to be 100%, but also uh, just the, um, the amount of time that's required because a lot of, there are a lot of logistical pieces to this that we've been working on. And um, I have to say that uh, there have been hours and hours of talking uh, with the three of us and others as well about logistics because this is, it's important that we anticipate as much as we can. But with any kind of piloting that we will do, there's, we're doing it this way so we can learn in terms of what goes well, what doesn't, how we need to adjust some of our uh, procedures. And then, uh, of course, doing with staff was flawless um, as we did the, as we did that. So, um, Dr. Franke, you're here. I don't see you. You're probably, you're here. Um, yeah. I know you've probably been listening as we're trying, as we're going through this, but um, there, we, there is um, a lot of continuous research on in pool testing. And I, I don't know if there's any comments you would like to make before we open it up for questions. Um. I didn't hear everything that um, Cindy said, so I apologize, I, I couldn't get in. Um, I will say that one of the things I like about the pool testing, the way that it is formatted, the way that Dr. Bodhi and Cindy have formatted it is that we're looking at smaller sample size, which give you more accurate results. So the larger your pooled test, I mean, there are some places that will go up to 25 swabs. The larger your pool test, the more there's a possibility for what's called a false negative. There could be what uh, it's basically like diluted results, so there wouldn't be like enough genetic material to be picked up. So we're keeping the pool samples small so that it has far greater accuracy. So it really is equivalent to having, as long as we keep those pool size uh, small, it's pretty equivalent accuracy to the individual PCR tests. Um, and then the Binax antigen tests which would be the follow-up, should we have a uh, positive cohort, a positive pool, are pretty accurate as well, especially in somebody who is symptomatic. Even more accurate with adults than children, but um, pretty good fidelity in terms of accuracy. So I, again, I, I didn't hear everything that was said and I'm not sure if there's any other information that I could share with you, but I'm pretty confident in the, in the, um, the robust um, accuracy of this test. So. It's, it's a good move. So we did receive those pool tests back um, about two hours ago. So we know that, um, you know, we're looking at less than 48 hours of getting the results, which will help with our um, logistics and our response. And they were all, it was accurate. It, it matched our, um, 
individual PCR testing. So nobody pool tested this week who didn't um, do a individual PCR test as well. So we would know ahead of time um, as we kind of try to work through the science and logistics of this. Any questions? Um, so I think we'll go in our usual order to, to talk about questions. I just, I wanna, um, I, have, I have questions that I will hold for the end, but I do wanna say, um, first off, that this has been an, just an extraordinary effort. It's something that um, the school committee has been talking about for many, many months and the community has, and um, that that this district has, you know, taken a really, uh, clear and um, consistent stand on the need for testing and has moved towards that. It has been so impressive. There is nothing, there's no education or professional development that can prepare anybody to do this kind of work. I've been on some of the, um, some some emails about this in the very early stages and, and all I could think of was, gosh, this is way beyond my like, comprehension of what it takes to do something like this. And so it has been so extraordinary um, that the three of you and then you know your other colleagues have, have gotten us to this point. So um, I wanna go ahead and do questions. So Ms. Exton. Thanks. Um, I just wanna echo Ms. Morgan's comments and thank you all for the work that you um, have done and coordinating all of this. Um, you know, as a teacher myself, it's, it's, I think it's been really important for educators um, to have this kind of support um, and this kind of reassurance that, um, that testing is available near their schools. Um, and that, you know, for the most part, we're not seeing a huge number of cases. Um, I also want to thank Karen Donato and the Thompson nurse for, um, you know, being willing to pilot this uh, pool testing and for students, I think it's a it's a huge next step. Um, and I also just appreciate all of you being really proactive about there being financial constraints and um, finding ways to work to work around that. Um, and I'm also glad uh, to hear that you've uh, signed up for the for the state program. That was sort of my question um, comment coming into this was that I was hope, hoping that you um, would choose to, to do that. So one of my questions is, um, is the teacher going into the coat, like when we start to do this, are we, if the teacher goes in with cohort A, does cohort B have to then quarantine as well just because the teacher will not be able to come in or Dr. Bodie, are we gonna have staffing? Well, um, the, the answer is it depends on staffing, really. Uh, we would like cohort B to, if let's say hypothetically, a teacher in cohort A test positive. I will say this, so that our, our intent is, and, and we will be able to provide a follow-up testing right away for teachers. So we will, they will know whether they are Positive. I have to say that in the evolution of our thinking on this, we may not test teachers in the same batch with students, but this is evolving as we think this through. But to your question, should that happen? Then as we have right now, if we can have staffing, uh, cohort B can be in school and then uh, we can have a staff member there and teacher teaching remotely. That's happened. Um, it depends on the situation, whether how doable it is. As, as I had mentioned the other day that we are keeping um, our other staff teaching assistants and building subs within a, a two grade uh, span in the elementary. So there's some unknowns. And another unknown that we don't know is that Right now, the, in the general population, people are testing right around two and a half percent. So if we have that same percentage with our students, how many classrooms or perhaps a learning community um, may be affected by this? And that is, I think that is one of the things that is an unknown and certainly um, 
something that we have to consider in all this and pa parents have to understand that as well, that that is the consequence of more testing as well. I, I don't know if, uh, we've talked about this so much. I don't know if anybody else wants to add a comment to this. So Bill, we are going to take steps next week during the pilot um, to separate the teachers from their pools um, and to test them that day with the uh, Binox tests um, I, for a couple of reasons. I think that if the pool comes back and they've been in that classroom, I think there's, you know, we're, we're trying to, to manage this also from like the emotional impact it may have. Um, so we're, we're putting everything in place that we can to um, assure our staff that um, so that they have an understanding of where their health is as these pools come in. Um, so I think that that'll be important next week to see how that um, you know, how that works. So the Binax tests have been um, great to have and, and the nurses all are, are able to use them um, quite easily. So that's, so we will, we will, it, next week we will learn a lot of lessons. We are though hoping that we have ironed just about every foreseeable issue out um, already, and that was certainly one of them, is we don't want to take a teacher out because of a pool um, and then have, have not have the ability to bring the other uh, cohort in. So are they, so are the teachers not, the teachers are not getting tested in any pool? Like they're still gonna have to be individually tested? So next week we are offering um, the individual PCR test on okay. Tuesday. So they're signing up for that. Then again, this is optional. At Thompson, they will have the option of, of participating on Tuesday, as, as everyone else will. They will also have the option of taking a Binax rapid test the day that the pool test is taken, the day that we do the surveillance testing. So they'll have an opportunity. And again, though, this is voluntary. So this is um, if, if the teachers want to do that. So we will have that ready to go and, and they will be offered that and explained why um, so that they, you know, they can rest well over the weekend. Um, I believe we're probably going to do it on Friday. So the results I'm hoping will be in Sunday. Um, and then we'll have Monday, of course, um, to give us some, some room to kind of figure out what needs to be done as a result of any um, positive cases. So we, we're really taking care to, to be sure that we have the supports in place for our staff. As we're as we're going through this, so okay. So I guess what I guess my my concern is that if we pool, if we at some point are pooling only staff together, and that pool tests positive, that takes out five ten staff members. Right. So yeah. that and that's so we in, in terms of the staff pool testing, we are we've been thinking about that longer than the classroom piece, because the classroom piece, I think for us weeks ago, several weeks ago, when we started talking about pool testing. I don't think that anybody kind of conceived that we would be able to figure out how to, how to pull that off, funding, logistically, materials, labs. Um, so we've been, we've given a, a lot of thought about how we would pool staff. And in that instance, we would keep the swabs, you can, you can have a minimum of five swabs per tube. So we wouldn't do more than five. And as we're doing it, we would keep the central location. So we would have a, a, a larger, easier opportunity to mix the pools. So we don't have, so if five teachers from the Bishop walk up, you know, we're gonna know that and we're gonna split them up and not have five teachers from the Bishop going into the same pool. So the first issue is pooling in a way that isn't going to have uh, op detrimental operational impact. So, and that's, um, for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about school operations. Um, and so, so there's that. The other piece of it is the rapid test available to immediately respond to a positive pool. So in the end, what we hope is that pooling people together um, won't matter because we'll be able to respond so quickly that we won't be um, impacting operations of the building. Um, and, and we won't be impacting personal lives either. We're just, we're, we're hoping that we'll be up to speed and be able to offer rapid tests. Um, and if the numbers continue as we have seen all year, 
we're not going to be it's it's not going to be a logistical nightmare to to test one pool of of people because what we've seen is one two at the most for many weeks zero thank you sorry my phone um no, thank you. And I, I again, I, I really appreciate how complicated this is and how much thought has gone in, into that. Um, my last comment um, is I would it would be great if Arlington could have a dashboard, much like a lot of the other districts um, have just to share uh, the case counts and and how those things are are going. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. And uh, yes, thank you all for all your efforts and for getting in both to this pilot and hopefully the state pilot. Um, so one one clarification, I, I did see the email from um, Mr. Nato at, at Thompson and it looks like the pilot is actually going over two weeks. So one cohort A is coming next week and then cohort B will be the following week. So, that, so it'll be over two weeks. And then what's is, is there currently a plan to roll that out further? Or are we going to wait for the state plan to kick in? We, so the first week in February, we'll roll it out to additional schools. So we, what what we would like to do, and what we've been working every day to do, is to roll this out as widely as as is responsible to roll out. So we plan on engaging in the present pilot um, as extensively as we can, without. Um, being a detriment in buildings without without um, bringing it into a building that isn't perhaps prepared for the logistics around it. So um, we most likely will see it in the middle school um, the following, the same week as, as the Thompson cohort B is done. Um, uh, Brian Maringer is all systems go and he's already kind of you know, he's already kind of thought through what it would look like there and the logistics of how that would work. Um, Dr. Janger has already thought through the way that we could um, efficiently pool test students walking into the high school because um, it gets complicated for the high school needs to say because you have the students who are there um, at different parts of the day or the students are there full day and then the students coming in. Um, but Dr. Janger has already thought through some of those things. So people are are thinking through. So we, we want to engage in the present pilot um, as, as responsibly as we can and as fully as we can. Um, and my hope, of course, is that we'll be in a really good position then for the state to look at us and say, yeah, they've got the infrastructure and they're ready to go. So, um, the, you know, and allow us to participate in their pilot. Great. And then the other question is the the state guide, guidance on the on their pilot says that the pooled results do not need to be reported to the local or state DPH. Are we planning to to share that information in our pilot? Yeah. So that um, that I'm sorry. There's, we're working on so many letters today. That information um, I believe was shared that the the pool testing is not reported. Um, as we've said from the beginning, a case isn't a case until it's a case. Um, and that is when an individual has been identified as being COVID positive. So with the pool testing, that's not a case. That's not something that we have to report to the state. It's not something that goes in the state system maven. Um, so we do not have to report that. Desi also um, gave us further instruction and information about if we were gonna engage in reflex testing um, which is the response testing to a positive pool and what that could look like um, and, and lifted some of the restrictions about what that could look like. So the state's thinking along these lines too and kind of shifting um, some of their practices. Dr. Franke. Uh, thank you. Um, so we had to get what's called a CLIA waiver in order to do these Binax antigen tests. It's basically a waiver from the state labs to be able to conduct what's called a point of care test, sort of like getting a rapid strep test, for example. Once we do that, we put the information, um, the parents or guardians have also an account with something called Project Beacon. That is the, the third party vendor that is the same vendor that the Stop the Spread sites have. So if you go to a Stop the Spread site, Project Beacon is managing your information and sending, sending it to the state. So the state will have the results of the antigen tests, positive or negative, but they won't have the results of the pool test. I just wanted to clarify that a little yeah. more. Great. So my, my only suggestion is um, that that wasn't discussed in, in, in Principal Donato's letter. And I think it's an important point um, for parents um, that 
even if the pool comes back positive, they're not going to the the cohort might might be remote, but they're not required to quarantine until they individually get a positive test. Um, well, so that I, might be that, might be, that, that might be in, in an FAQ or something as a follow up yeah. going forward. And I, and I think we will on on Tuesday, um, or possibly over the weekend. Karen, I know uh, Karen and I are working on a project on Sunday together, so we'll spend some time thinking about additional um, information. Great, um, thank you all. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. Thanks. Um, I also appreciate all the work that's been being done on this. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of behind. I think there's been emails that I haven't seen, like the one from Ms. Donato. Um, I appreciate the desire to decrease cost and I very much appreciate the ability to test students, but I'm wondering a bit about the turnaround time um, and I'm trying to understand the logistics of how we're putting cohorts into remote or not and whether they need to quarantine um and i guess one thing that would be helpful is just if we had this whole thing written down i mean maybe it's already on there and i just haven't seen it yet but um i i listened to what you said and i could kind of follow it but i'm not sure i'm missing some stuff um but i'm Right now, what's the turnaround for the PCR test that we're doing? So the PCR turnaround is about um, no more than 24 hours. Sorry, I'm in the office. Um, it's no more than 24 hours. And it, it before it was, we saw results rolling in by four o'clock the next morning. Um, and now it's getting later and later as the volume increases. Um, but tw 24 hours at the most. Right, what we're seeing, what we saw with our um, smaller staff pilot this week was um, a, a little a, a more than 24 hours from the time they received the um, the box of the lab. So it's it's sent to the lab the night of the testing, um, and so we're talking about two days the day two days after the testing is right now the turnaround. Part of their pilot is moving that marker so that it's a 24 hour timeline. So that's part of what they are working on very specifically is to get that turnaround to 24 hours. And so okay. that becomes a little bit of a what's the better day to do it um, so that we have some time to deal with the fallout. Right. That That's kind of, I'm trying to think of logistically, I, I'm concerned about a 48 hour timeline, basically, that it means that we'll have more kids who are maybe exposed, but maybe not and I can't, there, there's too many things up in the air for me to figure out what it means, but um, I just wanted to say, I, I appreciate that we're saving costs, but ha have the PCR tests gone up in price or are they staying the same? Um, they're, they're, they're staying the same. It's, it's the, the cost per week is pretty drastic. Um, for, for those who are opting in the, you know, and again, it's a matter of the timing. I mean, if, if we, if we did testing on Fridays, then we know that that those results are back and we can manage the operational piece before people are back in school. Um, but or Mondays, if we do it Mondays, then we can get it done by Wednesdays. I, I, I understand what you're saying and the 48 hours you know, I, I break in a cold sweat if it's 6 a.m. and the results aren't in yet. Um, yeah. the next day. We are talking in terms of student population, it's it's kind of that or nothing. Right, um, and, and that's, I understand for, I'm, I'm kind of delineating between teachers and students. Students, I think anything is great. Um, and so I, I would like to see all this in writing by somebody um, if possible, just because it's it's too hard to put all the pieces together and think through and be able to ask uh, pertinent questions. But one other thing I wanted to know is, what if you had the staff test both with their cohort and in a single pool? So do two tests for pooled. 
so that that way, if only one of those is positive, you know it's not the teacher, right? I mean, or if, if yeah, basically, if, if one of those is positive, you know it's not the teacher in that cohort, right? Um, and it, I mean, yes, it gives you one more test to do, but it's a way of maybe keeping some of the kids in school or, or keeping a teacher in front of them um, for hopefully not, you know, a little bit more inconvenience and, and stuff, so. Yeah, Dr. Um, Dinger had a whole algorithm about that. So we could just do pool testing and we'd know the results, you know. Um, yeah. Right? If people participate in several different pools, I, I do believe that as we roll through this, what is also gonna become available is, is more of the rapid antigen by, by both Abbott Labs and by Concentric. And we may get to a point very quickly where for our staff, that's the offering. Okay. Um, I guess the other question I had about the antigen test and the, Dr. Frankie said that it's positive, especially in the case of a symptomatic person, but if somebody's symptomatic, they shouldn't be going to school, um, either kids or, or teachers. So uh, I'd like to learn more about how that works if in asymptomatic people. So thank you. You want me to answer that now or? Yes, please okay, go ahead. So, um, so it was Lowell General, they did a study uh, that was well over a thousand people and they did concomitant testing, PCR and antigen. And um, within a seven day window, they had the most accuracy of anywhere on average 85 to 98%. Um, the folks who were truly asymptomatic and had zero symptoms, um, they, they didn't, it wasn't quite as robust. I mean, that is a concern because I do wonder about children, especially if their viral load is low. Um, but at the same time, if their viral load is low and they're not producing a lot of um, genetic material because it's early days for them, then it, it may be negative on the PCR too. So it's not a perfect system, but it's a really great system. It is a system that's being used um, in many states across the country as just a screening tool. Um, a lot of places aren't even using pooling tests, pool tests, they're just using the Binax tests. Um, the, the cost of them is relatively low. We're getting them for free from the state right now, but um, I do have confidence though that, th the problem is you, you mentioned someone shouldn't be coming to school if there are symptoms, and you're right, they shouldn't be, but we're seeing it happen. I mean, really mild symptoms, even with adults, oh, I have a headache. Well, there's so many things that could be a headache but it could also be COVID. So I think sometimes people are on the fence of, she was, I just have a headache um, and they're coming in anyway. Fortunately, every Binax test we've done so far has been negative, um, but, but you are raising a very good point. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Um, and I wanna echo what everyone said about the good work uh, our team is doing. I think, you know, it sounds to me like we're way ahead of other districts. My, um, so my observation is 18 positive tests out of 3,500 tests taken. I forgot the exact number, uh, <clears throat> but that is, that is a low, that's low. That's, I mean, I think people should feel good about that. Do you have any, I mean, I can just, as an employer, I can tell you that's a, a very low rate. I mean, um, do you have any comparative data, other school districts that are doing testing and to how we compare? Like, and also, I do want to clarify for the public, we're talking, this is uh, testing of teachers and other staff, or is it just teachers we're talking about? No, it's teachers and staff, anybody. But I will, qual I will qualify that. You have to be in a school building to qualify. Okay. So um, how do we compare to other districts? Does anyone have that data? Have you kind of talked to any colleagues in other districts for any information? I think the person to ask is uh, perhaps Dr. Franke, who is in touch with a lot of the other directors. First of all, not that many districts are testing as we have been testing. So there's probably not a big pool of people to compare to. Um, so anyway, let me just let her answer because I know she's in constant contact with her, her colleagues. Yep. So, um... 
the the biggest rollout that I know of is Wellesley. They've had a pretty robust yeah. rollout, um, and they're getting their numbers are not high. They're not getting large positive pools, so that's good. I mean, they've had some you know uh, some high school kids that have come up positive. That's um, but it's been a pretty good rollout for them, and they've they've utilized different testing formats as well. Um, I'm not familiar with everything that they're doing, but it's been a successful program. I have to tell you that um, I'm really surprised that this, a lot of the surrounding towns are not doing it, um, but might be, are certainly considering it. I was on a meeting last night with some of them. Uh, the only one that is doing uh, testing on students right now is Medford, but they're also in the collaborative with Somerville and the Broad Institute uh, through Tufts. So I think that's why they're rolling it out as well. Um, and they've had pretty good luck. They've had to shut down schools as a result of some of their testing. Um, and I only know that anecdotally through some of our own nursing staff. Um, but yeah, a lot of our surrounding towns who I'm uh, in close collaboration with are just starting to look at this. Okay. So All we right. are well, way ahead of the game. I think we should feel good about the positivity, positivity yeah. rate. I mean, I think it's a very good sign that people are for the most part, being careful and cautious and using good judgment. Um, so, and even if, you know, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to, and even those, and I want to imply that people who test positive are not using good judgment, but uh, I think um, <clears throat> we have a low positivity rate and we should note that and be aware of it compared to other other places. Um, the other point I, I, I was, Mr. Cardin was asking about this and I was confused as I was following along about who, it, and I'm talking about student pool testing. If a student, uh, who tests, so who's gonna quarantine? Can you clarify that? Like if a, in, a, in, a, in a student situation, is that? So um, yeah. there, there are two different responses to yep. a COVID positive case. There's the school response and then there's a quarantine order. Yep. The school response is if you are, a close contact, if you've been identified as a close contact, then we will see you on day 11. So day zero being the day of the contact and then out of our buildings for 10 full days and then back in on that 11th day. Quarantine orders have shifted um, twice in the last couple of months. Yeah. So right now the quarantine orders are, if you test if you test negative on day five, then you can come out of quarantine at the end of day seven. So um, they are, so for us, if you're a close contact, we'll see you on day 11. If a positive pool comes back in a, a classroom, um, that classroom, we know there's a positive case in that classroom. So that classroom, those 12 students yeah. and that teacher, um, would be considered close contacts in an elementary setting, those 12 students and a teacher and a TA would be considered close contacts. So they would pivot to remote um, in the circumstances of a pool test come, coming back positive. Even if, um, if we roll this out um, district wide, if parents choose not to get their students tested and just keep them in quarantine for 10 days. Um, so you can quarantine for 10 days if, you don't test um, and you have no symptoms. So we may not know, if we roll this out, we may not know the individual who is positive because we can't force anyone to have um, an individual test. But we do know that that small group of people um, are close contacts. So, those, so we would wanna keep those pools together so that it doesn't have an impact outside of a group that wouldn't otherwise be close contacts. I see, so automatically everybody in that pool is a close contact by definition and you really can't do the kind of contact tracing you would normally do. Right. Right, okay. I was confused about the dilution of the pool, Dr. Frankie was saying. What, so what is, if we're talking about 10, 12 people in a pool? Or so, I just want to just insert something. So in the, the new lab with Concentric, they, they are not diluting. So that is um, okay. why this is really exciting because each swab, um, the, the accuracy will be much higher in a pool test like this okay. than in a test that is diluted. 
So I thought that was important that we we're involved in this particular pilot and they have that. And I'm sure that Dr. Frankie can explain that further, but that in, with the concentric lab, um, their accuracy rate should be better than some of the surveillance um, testing that's going on across the country where those labs are diluting um, the, the samples and- Because the average size of our pool is, if I heard you correctly, is 12, 10, 12 people. Is that consistently? Yeah, so, okay, that's a small, it seems like, I mean, I'm not into the field, but okay. So I, I can't speak on concentrics. I would love to go tour the facility, uh, the new one that um, City was mentioning. Um, I can't speak on what they're using as any kind of diluent or, um, uh, I, I don't know how they're processing them specifically. I, the information that I'm sharing is all straight from the CDC. So, uh, which is easy to find. Um, CDC talks about the larger the sample size, the more you can have that false negative result um, because of because of the diluent. So uh, okay, yeah, got it. Okay, thank you for clarifying. I didn't mean to go down that path. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th this is this this sounds really good. I'm I'm really impressed by the work you're doing. Um, this the town is maintaining a website and is reporting statistics. And the thing that has me anxious is that for the age zero to 19 cohort, we had 53 cases on the day before Thanksgiving and yesterday was 161. And uh, I don't know, this is the, the graph that, uh, uh, that applies. And I'm just wondering, in, in, you may not have the expertise to understanding what's going on with that whole cohort of, of town-wide cases but I'm just sort of wondering how this compares, contrasts, impacts what we're looking at with our students. So they, um, I don't know what the most recent breakout is, but the last breakout of that age group that we saw, um, it was clear that the high school age group had a higher incident of transmission um, and positive cases. So that, I mean, that tells us, well, I, I guess that it can probably tell us whatever we want it to tell us, but for sure we see that, you know, high school students are not, um, some of them are making, many of them are making very safe, healthy decisions um, and others are less concerned and possibly they aren't concerned about the individuals they're with at home, um, but there's more uh, togetherness at the high school age and, and probably um, some of, of um, what they're engaging in is a little bit riskier, which is of course natural that high school students would behave in a riskier manner than the younger students. But that last time I saw it broken out and uh, Paul, I don't know what the latest breakout is, um, but I do know the last breakout um, and possibly the one before that, the, it was the 15 to 19 um, that had the larger numbers. So hypothetically moving forward, even though the state's in really tough shape right now, we're one of the top five in terms of uh, per capita, I believe when last I looked at the Washington Post and we're above the national average in terms of uh, confirmed cases at this point. So, you know, I am nervous, I am anxious, I am worried uh, just because of what I'm seeing uh, being expressed publicly. So. I guess the translation that I'm hearing from you is that for our K to eight operation, we're, we're doing really well. The teachers aren't testing positive. The kids are doing well. We're not seeing many cases, but uh, uh, hopefully by the time we get to having kids in the building at the high school on a more regular basis in February, that curve will drop down and we'll be in a little better shape. So we're gonna be watching that, right? Um, some teachers in the high school are being tested right now. Uh, teachers who have been uh, working with students that are in the school. So it's not like we haven't tested any teachers at this point. And the incident rate has been very low. Um, so as... as um, no, I, I understand that. But I'm saying as, as we get to the point yeah. where we're going to have 
more kids in in the building at the end of February, uh, that's going to, you know, we're sort of hoping that the the curve will be down, the vaccinations will st uh, start to kick in, and uh, we're not going to get slammed as soon as we start uh, increasing our student population in the high school building. That That's my hope and, and my worry too. Well, in the high school, Dr. Jenger is here. Um, we are still maintaining the six foot distance, the mass, all of those protocols that we've had in our other schools and uh, our ventilation system has been brought up to design capacity, which I think is really important in this particularly in the winter months and in some uh, rooms putting air purifiers. So we're putting in um, the, the infrastructure and the, and the safety protocols says keep this as safe as possible. But to your point and Cindy's point, this is the age group that would have a higher incidence than our younger children. Um, and that's been shown with the, the, the town data as well as um, data other in the state as well. Have we received uh, an estimate as to when we are going to be able to start vaccinating teachers and professional staff who interact with kids? Well, teachers are in um, phase two, as you know. The estimates on this keep vary quite a bit. Um, I know that right now, the rollout of who's going to be in which particular group they can be vaccinated, one has been changing a little bit. And uh, the Department of Public Health is rolling it out more on a week to weeks, you know, two weeks out kind of information. So the, the short answer to that is we don't know. And it could be that some of our, um, our teachers who are 65 and older and who um, maybe Arlington, Arlington residents may be able to have a little earlier. I'm not sure. There's, there remain a lot of questions about this. I, I think I've, I've asked that question so many times, and the, uh, I, I don't think there's any clear answer on that right now. Okay, just uh, as word leaks out, uh, let us know, because... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I yield the balance of my time. Mr. Hainer. Thank you all. Uh, Dr. Frankie, uh, Ms. Karn, I really appreciate you and all your staff and all you've done. When you signed on for these jobs, you weren't expecting to be doing anything like this and I'm very appreciative of the quality of the work you're doing. Um, when the pilot is over, will this be done? Are we looking to do this in all the schools at least once a week? How often will this be done? The, the goal certainly is once a week, whether or not logistically that will happen. Um, and when we say tested once a week, you're talking about two different cohorts. So in mm -hmm. fact, that's twice a week. Right. So we have to look at how we can manage that district wide. And if that is um, plausible. The other question, and uh, bear with me because I, I don't understand how, how you do this. I'm in a classroom, uh, there's a pool, we all get tested, it comes back, one of them's, a, a, we get a, a notification there's a positive in that, in that class. So we're all told to go home for, uh, you'll see us on the 11th day, as you said. Is there immediate testing on that day we come back? Or do we assume that if anybody had it, they're over it? Yeah, so that would follow state guidelines and CDC guidelines in terms of, um, their own quarantine even without taking a test. So yes, yeah, so there would be no requirement. Once quarantine is over um, and once our 10 days are over, we don't require tests to come back. Okay. Uh, All right, is, just, just to clarify though, but once the pool comes back positive, each member of the pool will have an opportunity to come in for a rapid test. So um, is that a question about the classroom or staff? Classroom. So in our pilot, we are going to offer an opportunity for that testing. District-wide, we don't know if that's, um, if we will be able to provide that level of reflex testing for all of the students. 
Um, so again, for the pilot, we plan on doing that. Um, we, we don't want to promise something that we can't deliver. Um, and so we need to be mindful of, will we have the material to do it? Do we have, um, you know, right now, in total we have what 400 um, and something by an accessor, or is it, do we have the first 400? We have about 750-ish. And so that's what we have. Um, and you can imagine that we could roll through that pretty quickly. Um, and if we don't have an ability to get to replace that, then we have to see what the weeks bring. Um, we, I know Armstrong, so there's a, Abbott is talking about rolling out um, and, and making available these tests much more widely. And so that will make a difference as well. Yeah, just to follow up, um, in that classroom, student A gets, uh, the result comes back positive. Do you then consider isolating all, you know, you know the students in that room, they have brothers and sisters throughout the district. Is there a ripple effect throughout the district? No. Okay. Uh, if there is, no, there will not be, we will not consider anybody outside of the pool of close contact without having an identified positive individual case. So there will not be contact tracing um, as a result of a positive pool um, beyond the contact tracing of anyone who is in that small cohort. Thank you. Um, so I have, a, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, and maybe this is actually a question for Dr. McNeil, can somebody remind me about the translation capacity for the Google form? We're obviously relying on that to do the parental consent at Thompson. And I know that um, I know that Karen's great about making sure that everybody can can read it and gets it, but but I know that can can somebody just remind me about where we're at on translations for Google Forms? So um... When, when there's a, we have various forms that we translate um, in of itself. So you don't have to go through the Google, you know, translation process. So if there's a form that we feel that, you know, needs to be translated. So that particular consent form, we can send it out to Bay State translators. We have a line item in our operational budget to handle that. And we can get the form translated. And then um, in the languages that uh, we've been identified as the most frequently used in Arlington. Okay, but that hasn't happened yet, correct? No, because I, from what I believe, I don't, I'm not sure if we have a, if, uh, Dr. Franke can uh, 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 affirm this, that we, I don't know if we have a final draft of the consent form as of yet. Um, I have sent a draft. I don't know if it was finalized um, or, or vetted yet but I did send in a consent draft. Okay, great. Well, let's just, let's, let's, let's get that translated as soon as, as possible. Absolutely, That's right. Really, as well that as seems like really important because we, we really want people to engage in this because it's only as effective as it is that people actually um, sign up. Um, my other question was, um, so I know that we've had a couple, actually a couple may not be right. I know there's been at least one after school teacher um, at Thompson that was a positive case. Um, are, are the after school teachers at Stratton Bishop, Dallin and the BASC program eligible for testing because they're not technically APS employees? Yes. So I, they I, are or they're not? They are. Great, okay. Yes. Um, and then the other question I have, oh, so, so we were talking about these teachers, right? And they're in their pool and then there's five of them. I'm better with like specific numbers. So there's five of them and the pool test positive. And so then you Binax test them, which makes sense. And you have your result right away. Is a negative Binax test enough for them to come back into school as long as like presumably of that five, you get you should get one positive, right? Or two or five, God forbid. But assuming they're not a close contact, which whichever is your pool, like your your positive, then that teacher can come back to school. Yes. We the Binax test is good enough for us. A negative on that, as long as they are not a close contact, is good enough for them to get back in. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then for the for the students, um, I have two questions about the reflex is the problem is the the reflex testing is the hard part, right? Obviously. Um, so the first part is so next week, right? I don't know. We get our first positive pullback would be my, what I would expect. How are like we gonna bring those kids back into the building? Like one of them has COVID, right? <laughs> so like how like how how is that gonna how's that gonna work? Because we're gonna buy next test those kids to find out which one it is. Right. And again, that would uh, that would that would be a different additional consent. So again this is an offering and they don't yeah, understood. Like okay. And so I'm going to, my next question is going to be about once we're out of the pilot, but let's, I'm, I'm playing out the first, you know, next week first in my head. So if, um, if a positive pool came back, we would contact that family and we would already have a plan. We will, we already have a plan in place. Um, we have two different plans actually. Um, and if, they choose to, we'll give them a consent. Um, that was one piece that Desi stated on the um, larger state meeting earlier this week is that they will allow a cohort to come back in a building for the Binax now test um, if the pool comes back uh, positive. Now, would they come, they would not be coming into fully into the building if we did it in the building at Thompson. Um, we figured out an in and out exit strategy, and then um, we would we would have that particular area electrostatically cleaned after, and 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 then some, um, and it would be a very small footprint. The other plan is to do a, um, and depending on the numbers and the weather, is to do a drive up. Um, so when we do staff staff testing, when we started staff testing part of the challenge for staff, excuse me, um, part of the challenge for staff is if they were a close contact, um, it, was, um, it was difficult to be told you can't come in a building for a test that we're offering staff and you're a close contact, specific, especially if they were a close contact as a result of being in a classroom. So we, we developed a, a drive-through system for those um, staff members who are in quarantine or, or if they were on a, um, a travel quarantine. So we've already done, and then we did a drive-through in October in a much larger way. Um, so we could do a drive-through, um, weather permitting, um, you know, if it's raining out or snowing out, that could impact um, the, the testing itself. So if it was a smaller group, and a drive-through was possible, or a walk-up was possible. Um, we could do that. Thompson was one of our sites um, when we did um, when we broke it into um, three different areas in town to do test staff testing at the beginning. Um, and the nurse over there, um, Christina D'Onofrio, who is a, a just superstar, um, she has a whole system out the window of of the nursing office, and she she's figured that out. Um, so there's several different scenarios that we already know could work. Um, and of course, we want to be mindful for any residents who don't have vehicles um, to access a drive, a drive up. So that will be, so the plans are in place. We know where it could be. Um, and we know all the circumstances on that particular day that would make one of those plans um, easier to implement um, and, and make a better operation. So that helps. Thank you. So, all right, so now we're in the next phase, right? Where, where we're not doing the reflex testing. So what I'm hearing is that kids, students are not going to be pooled with other students with whom they would not be considered close contacts. In other words, my kid is only good, my kids are only going to be in pools with other kids who if they had COVID, if they tested positive for COVID, my kids would already be close contacts of those kids. That's correct. correct. Okay, so then, because we can't do the, we, we're, we're not, we, at this point, we don't know that we can do the reflex testing on the kids. So the pool comes back positive. I'm not gonna get a call from the Board of Health or the Department of Health to say you're a close contact 
because we're not doing that. But I'm going to get a call from the school department and they're going to say, there was a positive pool, you're a close contact, right? So then my kid, I understand they can't go to school, but they also really can't go anywhere else either. So I think in until so that I guess that like that's the peak because like I've always the way it's always been in my head is that the Department of Health quarantines people right the school district like not really right but you you like the school department can say see you on day 11 you guys can say see you on whatever day you want as long as you're beyond whatever the state says but the the quarantine order is the piece that I'm trying to like wrap my head around so that's an excellent question and I think that is another um, point of clarification that we need to make to families um, maybe over the weekend or at the beginning of the week the pool testing comes back it is not an identified positive case but we as reasonable people know that somebody is positive and so that cohort that would be close contacts anyway if that individual is identified would go out of our building and we'll see them on day 11 uh, they would not be under a quarantine order, um, but we- Until the time that that you figured out who the kid was in that pool who right. had COVID, at which point the Department of Health would say, you're a close contact because you were with, because we now know, I mean, you wouldn't tell, we wouldn't tell them who the kid was, but they would now identify the kid and then they would know. That's correct. And we would work, okay. as we have all along, we work very, very closely with the Department of Health. Um, and we've gotten to a point where we're doing like these large scale contact tracing um, events. We're not doing the contact tracing, we're assisting them. But we're getting to a point where we're figuring out how to communicate together um, so that we don't have, I think the thing that was really confusing and difficult for families early on who were close contacts is they're getting a communication from us, they're getting a communication from the Department of Health, and then they have questions and who do you call. So we figured out how to combine um, a very efficient, clear way that information. Um, but the, the quarantine order still comes from the Department of Health. It might come through us but it's from the Department of Health. And in a case of, uh, if, if Jane, you took your child for a PCR individual test and your child was positive, that would be reported. We would work with the Department of Health. So there's, it's not like this whole other piece to what really should be kind of um, a, a nice smooth operation. So you're not kind of, you're not bumping it up and changing dates. Um, so, it, we would work together with them. So it wouldn't be kind of this, this, this whole other thing. And, and also to try to protect people's privacy. Um, of course. As well. And I mean, really the thing is, is if the, if the pool takes 48 hours to come back and then we either need to wait for, if it's in the pilot, it's going to take another, some amount of time to get that Binax testing. I mean, nurse Christina is a, is a miracle worker, but she can't bend time, right? So there's going to take certain amount of time to get that testing back. You're going to be close, you're going to be starting to bump against that fifth day where somebody could go and get their PCR test and then be out of quarantine. I get they're not coming back to school, but they're out of quarantine on day seven once they get like you could be very close to your potentially i see scenarios where you could find out i could find out there was that my kid was in a positive pool but then it i could be very close to that fifth day for pcr testing um so that then they're released from their quarantine on day seven right, right. what i anticipate is that families in arlington have been so thoughtful about this, regardless of kind of what their opinions are about some of the details, but people have been so thoughtful. So my, my expectation, my, I believe that what will happen is probably most people would want their child to be tested, contacting their pediatrician um, and, and st staying in. I don't, I don't see, I don't see a scenario where parents are, their child is part of a positive pool and while they're not in our buildings, but they're running around the community. I think that um, we've, we're, we're very fortunate to have a, a community like this and people have been really thoughtful about it. 
I agree. I just think that there are stressful situations when they happen to you. And so having there be like a really clear flow chart of like, okay, so like, when can we act like, how does that actually work? Like, when are you actually in a place that you can go? Okay. Um, that's it. That's all I got. All right. Anybody else um, follow up after we went all the way through? Okay. Seeing none. Um, thank you, uh, Sheridan Curran and Dr. Franke for coming um, and for spending so much time explaining us, explaining this to us um, tonight. It's so important. The work you're doing is so valued. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's, that's all we have. Oh, uh, Mr. Cardin. All right, just, just one last suggestion that we, we put out a district wide notice that this is happening because people are gonna start talking about it now that it already has gone out from, from Thompson. Okay, um, so the next, and Dr. Bodhi, do you need um, Ms. Sheridan Curran or Dr. Franke to stay beyond this? No, they've stayed longer than we, they anticipated. So thank you to both of them. They have just been an amazing team of people to work with. They, you can tell the, uh, the level of expertise and and commitment to this work. It's complicated, I can assure you, having spent many, many hours talking with them of all the various things we need to think about. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm trying to be better about releasing people when they're done. Um, all right, Dr. Janger, Arlington High School update. Thank you for your patience. Hello, hello. Um, well, it's always good to hear this gone through one more time because there's a lot of details and I'm always trying to fix them in my head. So um, I'm come back, as I understand it, to give an update on where we are in the semester two planning. So there's some details that have been uh, clarified in terms of the departmental shift, and then the details that are clarified in terms of what we're doing with the, um, what we're calling now at the moment, the in-person academy, um, in terms of increasing opportunities for students to have in-person instruction. So is it okay if I share the screen? Go for it. All right. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go fast because I know that all of you have heard um, many versions of this before. So hopefully you'll be quick studies. There is a, I'm gonna send this uh, slideshow out tomorrow. There is a little recording in there and I'll add some recordings for the different sections. But the basic summary is semester two is gonna look a lot like semester one and that most of the classes will be remote um, and following a similar schedule. There's some differences. Um, students who have been coming in in person will continue to have those offerings available to them. And there will be some expansion of offerings mainly based on identified students um, and students who are being invited in. So those are the two big pieces. Um, so in the departmental shift, each class will come in for, we've now determined for six in-person classes, those shifts per semester. That's roughly every other week, if you take out the first and last week um, and the weeks of MCAS and AP and other interrupted weeks. Um, English, math, history, and world language will rotate through the large spaces. Um, so the gym, the theater, the CAF, and so they have their own rotation. And then science, facts, art, and performing arts. At this point, we've figured out the spaces um, and the basic rotation. They're gonna have individualized schedules and specialized labs. And in the next couple of weeks, we will explain this to the community and let students choose whether they want to remain all remote. They'd stay in those classes, um, but they would opt out of the shifts and be provided alternative assignments. And we've also developed lists of high need students. Um, and from those lists, as I'll explain in a minute, we've developed what the class offerings will be and we'll be, um, we'll be in fighting those students over the next couple of weeks. Um, one thing I know people get concerned about or confused about is if in the departmental shift, students should expect um, that they can keep their current course selection and they'll continue to take three or four courses per week. Um, we're starting with making sure that everybody has the opportunity to take their three courses. And if there is additional, um, if there are additional courses or additional seats available in those courses, we will let students where appropriate take a fourth course. Um, so if you look at the schedule, it looks a lot like, but a little bit different from 
um, the schedule that we've been sharing. If you remember the last time I came here, um, I said that there was a solution for some of the travel time things, but that we hadn't cleared it past folks. So now we've had a chance to discuss this with all the departments. Um, so instead of what we've had this year, I'm sorry, this semester, which has been four 80 minute classes that were remote Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, you'll see that there's now five classes a week, same number of minutes of instruction, but it's 70, 70, and then a 40 minute class on Wednesday, and then 70, 70 again. And what we've done in order to do that is we've shifted those PE classes, the P1, P2, P3, and P4, to the middle of the day. And that does two things. One, it gives students a more structured time on Wednesday, an opportunity to check in, which for some students I think is gonna be really important. There's been a lot of conversation for students a little bit, still really appreciating this sort of break. And so there is still this break in the day, which is that it's, you have the X block in the afternoon where students can get extra support, where we can have meetings and clubs and those kinds of activities. Um, and in the end, students will also have a screen break that's a little longer spread out across the week. So the idea here is at any, half the school is taking PE um, and there are, and you know, only one quarter of them are in any of these periods. So at any given one of these periods, only one eighth of the students are in there. So most of the students at any given Wednesday, any given day have an 80 minute break. And so the idea is if you go to the shifts that the students are coming in as we've discussed 20 minutes early or 20 minutes late, depending on whether it's A or B or C or D block. There's half an hour breaks between the classes to allow students to transition home. But if students aren't able to transition in that period of time or don't want to, um, they can stick around and then there's an 80 minute break in the middle of the day that allows most students to transition in for their C block or out after their B block. Um, and the schedule people wanted to know the time. So this is the shift periods, just so you can see the difference in times. Nobody would ever follow this whole schedule, the teachers would. The student would, so if they're coming in for an A block class, they would come in at 8.30, they would finish that class at 9.20, and they would have then um, until the 9.50 class to get to their next class, the half hour for their remote classes. And then the teachers, whoops, and this is actually a nice feature of this. The teachers have the 50 minute class, then there's the 20 minute break before and the 20 minute after and the 20 minute break before. So they actually have a good chunk of time to make their, um, their setup change to allow the, build the rooms to air out um, between classes. So there's a really high level um, of COVID protection in terms of this model. And it's interesting because you know, we know that the district as a whole has been having a lot more in-person contact than most of the high school. Um, but there's a concern in the high school, obviously, that there's higher level, there tend to be higher levels of infection and transmissibility among the older students. But because we're doing this kind of spacing in the, we're in the room we're in, we're really using the larger spaces um, and we're creating large gaps between large cohorts of students. So we really can minimize close contacts and we can really do what I've been calling extreme distancing if we choose to. And so we have a lot of flexibility there. So the way the departmental rotation is worked out, we asked the teachers so that we could try to work around their daycare and other needs, whether by department they preferred Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday. It worked out pretty well um, that actually the different departments wanted different days. So the current plan is that in a two week rotation, it would go English for two days, history for two days, math for two days and world language. Each teacher would only come in for one of those two days um, in order to have all of their classes. And then in terms of labs, as we've worked it through, um, we're creating these specialized labs. We've got a two room chemistry lab. So it's one two room chemistry lab, one two room physics lab, two uh, two room life sciences labs, because there's a lot of classes that need those uh, facilities. Um, the visual arts labs, we're doing two two-room visual arts labs, although it may work out sometimes the teachers choose to use all four if they want the kids to spread out more. And then the culinary labs have actually already been doing a rotation using both of their culinary labs. And then the performing arts have a schedule that is too complicated to explain, but um, we're gonna, we have six patio heaters for under the links to allow for outdoor singing, which will push mainly towards the warmer times of the year. They can do some work in the theater 
and there's a whole bunch of new guidance around essentially masks for, um, for, for instruments. And so they're using those spaces as they can. Most likely some of those will shift their time so it won't be on an exact rotation, but they may do one day in and then wait a couple weeks and do two days in to do something like a lab or a special activity. But the expectation is that those classes will all come in at least six times. And so we've talked already about sort of what is the difference between the shift and the reverse field trips. Um, one is the frequency, but two is the planning that we're really gonna have facilities set up um, for those folks so that they can come in and run a class um, and that students are expected to opt in or opt out. So teachers will know in advance who they're expecting to come and how they're gonna plan around what it is they're going to do. And so this is that sample student now working around the actual rotation we envision. This student has four classes because they're taking chorus, but the idea would be that they would come in right for, they. so imagine their day. Um, on Monday is the first day of the English rotation. There are teachers coming in that day. So they could do block A and block B remotely, and they would have 80 minutes to travel into school for their 50 minute English class. And they would have a half hour to travel home, or if they chose, um, they might uh, stick around and do a study hall and uh, stay in for their English class. And then the next day, Tuesday would be all remote. Wednesday would also be remote with the 40 minute classes. Thursday, again, they would have 70 minutes, 70 minutes remote. They could transition in during the 80 minutes and take their English and study hall, or they could transition in during the 30 minutes and have their history for 50 minutes. And that's the same as you go through the rest of the week. And so in this one, as you see, they would have an English class and a history class, a chemistry class and a chorus class. Now it might work out um, that they cluster a little bit more um, you know, in one week or the other week, but the expectation is that over the course of a three week, of a two week rotation, you'd have all three or all four of your classes. And then just as a reminder, because some folks are saying, you know, what are we going to do? Obviously we're not gonna hold in-person instruction if that's a change in the district as a whole if there's reasonable concern about in-school transmission and we don't feel that we can do so safely. Um, and the nice thing about this setup is um, essentially that the teachers and the schedules don't shift if a student needs to be remote or if a cohort needs to be remote, we would simply cancel that shift. And if possible, we may shift it again later. Um, and then any and all students may choose remote. So there's not changes in what's offered to the different students remote. And as we said before, we're developing considerations about how those students will do it. And each of the departments has talked through what their expectations and what they would do in terms of um, alternate assignments. Um, so then we have the in-person academy. And what we decided to do with the in-person academy was to work sort of deductively, that is to say, start with student needs. So the deans, the guidance counselors um, have gone through the DNF list, we've gone through the attendance list, They've gone through students that are coming up in terms of screens around social emotional concerns, and they're getting recommendations from the teacher, the teachers. And so they've generated a list of high need students. We have a list of about 90 students on there. Um, and then they're looking through to see, first of all, what classes those students need and whether those students are appropriate for or receiving, receiving services elsewhere. There are other options. Our special education students have all been offered in-person instruction. Um, workplace program is still running, Harbor and Shortstop has room, the Learning Center is an option, Study Hall is an option, um, and we've also been doing individualized credit recovery with students using Play-Doh or tutoring or other programs. Um, but the courses have been chosen to serve the identified needs of the populations. Um, so the idea, one of having looked at those students, what came back very quickly from the teacher is given the concerns about these students' ability to engage, Having them come in for two days in person, one, half, one 40 minute remote, and then two days independent, um, they weren't particularly convinced that those students would be successful. And given the numbers that we're looking at in terms of high need students, we think that we'll be able to offer those students four days of in person with the Wednesday remote. So that's really what we're targeting, which would be classes of 12 to 15 based on our using four or five of our larger classrooms. Um, if you expanded it to 20, which would be the reasonable size of those classes, you'd add only a small number of students and you'd significantly drop the contact time for students who we think really are going to need it um, 
because most of the time, these issues around social emotional connection, which needs consistency and executive function, which really needs that consistent contact. So staffing has been a challenge. We've posted in English, math, science, and history. Um, we've done some hiring, uh, but science is, we are already a couple of staff in the hole in science anyway. We would have hired someone earlier just to fill large, large class sizes. Um, and um, we've had some, some staff that have left. So we are, right now we could easily off hire two more science teachers. So we think we might be able to offer one section of science. The other idea is that the classes would be offered A and B block so that students can fill their other academic needs in the afternoon, either remaining in the school or if they wanna transition home. If they're in special education, they could, they could receive their special education services and their third class in the afternoon. So I've already explained this, that we've got approximately 90 students identified and we'll start inviting um, soon. Um, and uh, what the sections that we at this point are planning on offering is we have um, staff two sections of Algebra 1 and two sections of Geometry. Um, in English, we would offer a 9-10 English that would be a sort of different than ninth and different from 10th. So a ninth grader could take it and then do 10th next year. Um, a 10th grader could take it and then, you know, they could flip flop either way. They could cover um, both of those, those things. And then in history, we're planning on offering US 1 and US 2 because a freshman can take US 1 um, and then follow up with modern history, modern world. Um, we're hoping that we can get an additional section staff, in which case we would also offer modern world, which is the required sequence. In science, we're looking at offering a physical science class um, if we can staff it. And then the rest of this is actually information we've talked about before, but I just think it's sort of important to know that there's still the 128 students who are in school. Those numbers are increasing and well, they fluctuate. There are some students who choose to transition out and we bring students in as we identify needs. And the timeline that we're working on, which is really very tight, there's an enormous amount of planning going on in terms of getting things ordered um, and um, scheduling, getting the information out to the kids, changing kids' schedules, preparing the rooms, all that. But the idea is that we're, we're now around here. Um, so we are, we'll finish up the department rotation schedule. Specifically, that's actually um, pretty much done. It just needs to be put into a clean form having the students opt in and opt out by the 25th so that we can have a couple of weeks to finalize their schedules. And then February 8th, semester begins. We have a break after the first week and then we would begin the shifts February 22nd. And so we've been buying lots of things. Um, we bought speakers, we've got screens coming in, we've got uh, headsets coming in for students, headsets coming in for teachers. Um, we've got projection screens, electric lights, all that thing, those things are coming together pretty quickly. Um, and then it's important to know that we're continuing to develop these other interventions, right? The credit recovery, the in-person options for struggling students. Um, right now, the mental health screener is going forward. At this point, we've screened the freshman class and the uh, senior class. Um, we are finding that about 30% of students are coming in at elevated levels of, um, I guess, concern which is consistent with what we've seen in other districts. Um, and every single one of those students then is individually contacted, their parents um, are contacted and they are offered, depending on kind of where they are in the hierarchy of need, as students who are really at extreme risk, they're recommended for evaluation um, and we support them in getting outside support. And then students who are simply at sort of at an elevated level of um, uh, mental health distress we're, we'll begin or we're beginning to run support groups in terms of resiliency and supporting those students. And that's been a really positive experience of making sure that we're having individual contact with each of these families and making sure that they're connecting to the resources. Because often, as much as we think we're getting the word out, um, the families that are most distressed are, are not really in the uh, ability to find necessarily or to, to strain it because there's so much information coming out and those individual contacts have been really positive. So that is it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Jenger. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Um, 
I guess I'll look for for hands at this point. Uh, Mr. Cardin and then Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Thanks for the update, uh, Dr. Jinger. Um, so with regards to the shifting the time to Wednesday, I, I see how that does um, help with, with some travel time um, concerns, but I, I've heard some concerns from, from faculty and students about that. And I wonder what, whether you've heard that similar concerns or whether you think the faculty is on board with it. It does require them to rechunk, you know, what they've done this semester into new, new, uh, a new time frames. So I think that's that's where the concern is. Students don't like you know losing their Wednesday mornings, but that's not not as much as my concern as the faculty having to redo redo what they've just done. So I mean the faculty have been consistent. They'd rather not change their schedule. They have really appreciated um, the way in which they've been able to use the time. Right, the this time has shifted at an eighty minute break every day. Is nice, but having this sort of larger time that they've already planned how to use and gotten used to using is a preference. Um, you know, and so, how would I say this? There's, a, there's, only, there's only so many things we can do, right? So the question was either to not change it, which would leave us with the concern around travel time, which we heard pretty strongly from a lot of folks, um, or to change it in order to support that. In terms of the Wednesdays, I heard on both sides, as you guys have heard in most of these surveys and things, um, that some people really loved the Wednesdays and some people found that for their students, um, they uh, really um, needed the structure that they simply sort of slept late and, and didn't make good use of the time. Um, we thought about surveying folks to see whether or not we could do it um, and at this point, I mean, I, if, if the school committee told me that you felt that it was important that we survey folks to get feedback on it, I would do so. Sometimes I feel like it's important to simply let people know what they have to plan for, because if we decide to go one way or the other, then they're waiting another couple of weeks for us to go around and get the survey out, get the feedback back and to make the choice. Sometimes on things like schedules, there's no keeping everybody happy. Um, and so you sort of have to make the call. So we, we, I spoke with each department individually um, and people were like, I'd really rather not change, but I can live with it was basically the feedback that we got. Um, and then some folks who were feeling higher levels of distress around planning were more distressed around making changes. So I had made the decision. I, yeah, I, I just, I've said, as I said to each of them, I had sort of made the decision to take feedback. And if it didn't seem like a deal breaker on the part of everybody, that this seemed like an option that was better. And one of the examples is um, our Boston bus, we're gonna run a new bus because we'll have more students coming in from Boston. And so they won't be able to fit on the bus all the time, but they can come in the morning. We can actually have the Boston bus take students who came in the morning home in the middle of the day um, so that then the remainder of them can go home with a bus that they share with the middle school. And so those sorts of shifts really make a difference in terms of equity for a lot of kids. Um, and so if it wasn't something that the staff were saying, we can't do this, it's going to break our, our structure, um, we thought we would do it. As one person said, some people will experience this as instead of having four classes, I get five, so I feel like I get more contact. And some people said, but it's a big thing to have to shift it around um, and sort of scrunch my classes. And then as one wise person said, yeah, I'm actually happy about one and mad about the other because it's just changing what it is we're already doing. So. Okay, thanks. I just, you know, wanted to hear that concern. Um, you know, the other the other option would be, of course, just ex expanding the lunch, you know, to an hour, which would have to extend the day, which would be, you know, a contract change. But I didn't know, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that this was more of a collaborative process, and um, you know, at least some thought was given with the staff to to come up to the solution. So, so this was shared with the faculty senate and the union before I met with you. Um, back on December 10th, but I hadn't had a chance to, st and then over the week before break and then the week right after break, I hit the last two um, groups. Um, we reviewed that with all of the departments. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Thielman and then Dr. Allison Ampey. Oh, sorry, it was Mr. Hainer after Mr. Cardin. Hainer, Thomas, Allison. 
Thank you, Mr. Cardin covered what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm clear and uh, others are clear. Each class will come in for six in-person shifts per semester. So if a student has two classes uh, in that semester, two core classes, they'll come in 12 times. Well, it's, the vast majority of students have at least three. Have three, okay. So they would come in 18 times. Correct. Okay. Um, if we get to a point where um, staff are vaccinated and um, the situation is different, is there a way to shift to more in-person learning in say April or May or even June? So you guys have asked this question every time <laughs> and I get it because I ask myself the same question. So I think realistically, um, depending on the content area and the, the staff, um, there are many folks who are trying to figure out, I mean, right now, Family and Consumer Science has actually been bringing kids in for shifts already um, and they do it every other week. So they're, um, they're, they're a little more rapid. I think as teachers are more comfortable bringing in the shifts and finding them more useful, um, you might see where there's space, people bringing in more shifts. If we're not able to change the spacing, right, if we still have to keep everybody six feet apart, we still have some significant limitations in terms of, um, of the facility. Because although the teacher may feel more comfortable, we're still expected to keep everybody spaced out for the welfare of the kids and transmission in the community. So um, I kind of wait for somebody to tell me that the levels have gone down and the level of infection has gone down and that that means we can be closer together and put more people in a room. And then, yeah, potentially you could find a way to sort of bring people in more regularly. Um, and it would really depend as everything is on the actual physical constraints that the folks gave me. I and mean, you, you've seen like with the testing, it's the devil's in the details, right? It's in terms of exactly how it works. Um, so it's possible, but I, I think more likely um, as numbers come down and staff is more, we'll, we'll do a, be able to really push more into sort of some of the in-person social activities, things like senior events will be a lot easier to run. Um, and if we can get more staff in more easily to supervise those, split them up, cover more students. Okay, thank you. And then um, this question came from a, a person in the community. I wanna make sure I answered it right. So I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, about the six foot distance between desks is from the center of the desk to the center of the desk, or is it from the edge to the edge? It's, uh, it's center to center. Yeah. It's, uh, okay. We, I think it's sort of shoulder to shoulder, as I understand it. The reality is um, the nice thing about the spacing that we're gonna use is you'll have plenty of room, right? You, because the, the classes are not going to be, I mean, what's weird about this is we, we're not gonna fill all of our spaces um, to capacity because there's no, there's sort of not enough to do a lot more. But so, you know, you're going to be having an entire 25 kids in a 3,000 square foot room. Um, you're not going to have to, it can be six feet shoulder to shoulder, it can be six feet nose to nose. We have plenty of room in those rooms for the whole class. They're big rooms. Got it. I, you know, one thing I would just say as, I mean, if we get our staff <clears throat> vaccinated, um, this is one person's opinion, so it doesn't really, it's not a, doesn't have the weight of law here, but um, I, I do think the district should do everything it possibly can to bring students and staff back. Otherwise, you'll have people going into the summer not believing we're gonna open in the fall. And um, that is not a good message to send to the community. So I'll leave you with that. I don't, uh, I'm one vote here, uh, but I will tell you that just my 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 sense of the community right now is the parent community and the and the uh, parent student family community in the town is that that's what they want to see and that and that you know so that's something to keep in mind as we proceed over the course of the next several months. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I can't agree with you more. I mean, we want, you know, we're, we're trying to keep our hand on the tiller as we wait to see what's coming going ahead, right? And as the epidemiology shifts, we're watching it. We meet every week in the core group um, and we will do as much as we can. I, you know, we're reading the tea leaves like everyone else, hoping that, you know, in February, is, if, if we get February vaccinations, then by March, people have their second vaccination. So then at the end, I mean, you know, you can count forward how it goes. I, when people ask me, um, I say that I, I'm strongly hopeful and sort of expect that in the fall, we will be back um, in person, but I don't know, right? But I, everything, having, as a, as a person who talks to a lot of people and thinks really hard about it, um, with vaccinated staff, with, I think most, anybody, anybody over 16 who wants to be vaccinated, vaccinated by June, I think that's realistic with summer dropping off because we have spacing. And so numbers in the non-vaccinated population dropping down to kind of where things were last July. Um, I think it's quite reasonable that we would be able to see an ability to be closer together with precautions in the fall. Um, and then we just all have to sort of take a deep breath as I've been trying to do and like not, I can't, I can't read, I can't, if anybody had told me on March 13th that this is where we'd be now, you know, I would never have believed it in a million years. So I have confidence that things are moving forward positively. And I think we just have to kind of breathe our way through things that are within our control. And as soon as we can make moves, we will. Okay, thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation or truncated presentation, Dr. Tanner. Um, so, I have also been hearing from families in the community concerned about the transportation, especially people say way deep down in the east where they're having to drive their kids to school because they, mm. there is no way for the kids to get there uh, quickly. Um, looking at the new schedule, if kids have a PE class, is it going to be scheduled so that it's not next to a class when they're scheduled to be in school so they get the 80 minute transportation block. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, we are not planning on hand scheduling, you know, Johnny so that he doesn't have an A block English shift and, and, uh, and uh, on that one every other Monday, um, a, a PE class. Um, I think the number of individual kids for whom they live in the far corner of town. They don't feel like they can walk. Um, you know, we don't have buses because the expectation is that the town is sort of walkable. They don't want to ride public transportation and, and all reasonable things. But the number of kids that that's going to individually impact, I think is going, I've done the math, like if it's this percent of this percent of this percent of this percent is going to be extremely small. And I think then they can give us a call and you know, we'll look at whether we want to do a lateral move or whether, um, you know, that teacher doesn't care whether they're on Monday and Tuesday and there's room, um, although that probably will affect more kids. So most likely it would be the kid would look at a schedule change or the kid might choose to opt out of that in-person instruction. Um, like I, that's the only way I can imagine being able to do that. Okay, but that makes sense. So if, if family, we can tell families if they're concerned about their ability to get the kids on time with the schedule that they have that they should reach out to the school. But you've got to um, figure on any given day, one eighth of the school has PE, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, what percentage of that, those kids then have English A or B block. So that mm -hmm. affects them at lunchtime. Um, and then, you know, what percentage of those kids live in the far corner of town? I think it's going to be a tiny number of kids and we'll just talk to them. Yeah, that, that's fine. It, it's just helpful. Um, it might then, be one of the only reasons we allow for a lateral move, but that will probably get me in trouble because um, lateral moves are, are not very popular and create scheduling problems. Well, I was thinking this PE could be moved. But yeah, and you could switch PE classes easily. Yeah, that, that seems like the easy one. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I'm still confused by we had families who were very strongly advocating for in-person education because their children are not thriving at home. Yet from your description for the in-person academy, I don't have the sense that 
were picking up the same kids who were their families were so concerned about. I don't know, um, but is is that your sense, or you know, are we talking about two different groups, or is this are we actually picking up these ones who were were so concerned? So we are referring kids, and the the, the list of ninety kids includes kids where there was social emotional distress. Um, it probably does not include what I would call the worried well. Like, you know, there, there are people who write me letters saying my kid's doing okay, but I'm really worried about them, right? And those folks, it's not picking up because that's, that's me, right? <laughs> like that's, that is a very large percentage of folks. We would rather kids are back in person. Um, I will say that, you know, once we've gone through the list and this is something we're, we're struggling with exactly how to do it and we'll wait till we know what the numbers are. I actually think that once we go through that list of 90, we will still have capacity. We still, um, you know, but, um, it, and if a parent is very concerned about their child, I mean, and we are, we are picking up, we're having conversations with those folks as a result of the screener. So the deans and the guidance counselors are calling um, and that's helping to flag for us whether we think we have services that will serve those students. Um, unfortunately for some folks, that are writing those letters, what they want for their kid, which is what I want for my kid, is a feeling of normalcy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's not that they want, they could come in yeah. right now and be in the learning yeah. center. They want to come in and be in a class that feels like a normal class, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and that requires us to get everybody else in, but then we don't have room for everybody else. So, um, you know, I think there will be some folks who think that's not what I was looking for, but I, I think that as those folks should contact their counselors and sort of think about ways to problem solve what they can do. Um, but again, if the kid's actually doing fine academically, if they're doing their work, they just really want more social interaction, um, they're probably not going to want to do this program. Okay. Um, and then my final question isn't exactly related to this, but I'm just wondering roughly what percentage of students right now are taking three classes and then what are taking four? Uh, so Kathy and I were going through that, trying to figure that out exactly, but it looks to be about two thirds are taking three and about um, almost a third are taking four um, and then a small smidge more are taking five. Okay. Um, Thank you. And we're hoping that we can get those numbers up and that'll depend on some on staffing in term two. Okay, great, thanks. And I'll be driving soon, so I'll be off, but listening. Yeah, and ju just to answer that question, so we've asked parents who are requesting that their student be able to take a fourth academic class, we're keeping a list, and basically they're on the waiting list once we've gotten everybody into their required classes. Mr. Hainer. Are we, are this, the high school students going to be required to take an MCAS test this year? We don't know. Um, the January MCAS, it's so funny, we keep writing notes and then they keep not being quite right. So I want to make sure I get this right on camera. The January MCAS was called off. At the moment, the recommendation, Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the recommendation from the, uh, the Department of Education is that there not be that for seniors who need the competency determination, seniors who haven't passed the MCAS, that they'll do it the same way as they did it last year for science, but that that would be, that they would do it based on passing MCAS level classes. So they won't have to take the MCAS. That has still, I believe, to be approved, but it's what the proposal is and is what I expect to happen. They're still saying that they will have an MCAS in the spring and they haven't given us all the specifics. Please keep us informed on that, uh, you, Dr. Bodie. I think it's important. I'm really concerned for those students uh, for prep. I realize there's gonna be a lot of latitude as a result of COVID and everything, but uh, a student that may not have math this semester and all of a sudden is confronted with an examination in math or English and not having it. So we are targeting students who we have concerns about who are not in those classes to make sure that they are getting MCAS preview classes um, and support so that, I mean, it's a small number of students in Arlington High School, thankfully. And so right, we're targeting but, the students for extra support. But historically, 
pre-COVID and everything, there'd be students in the sophomore and uh, junior years taking it, trying to get that requirement out of the way. Uh, you're talking about basically seniors that you have concerns with them. I can no, no, I'm talking about, so if there is based on their performance in ninth grade and their performance in eighth grade on the MCAS, a student who in 10th grade, we are concerned might be at risk of not meeting um, standard on math or English MCAS, we're making sure that those students get extra support. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else for Dr. Jager? Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Jager. Thanks for coming. Thank you all very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the synchronous learning time report. Um, I do want to I want to make sure that people are aware that we did meet. Was it only yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> so we met for a, a long time, like. I don't, I don't know, a couple of hours uh, in CIAA uh, led by Mr. Cardin and talked about uh, synchronous learning time. Um, so we've covered a lot of this already. Um, so um, Dr. Bodhi, do you wanna go ahead and start? Well, yes, um, for some of you, this will be a repeat, but I think for people who are uh, listening to this for the first time, I just wanna give a brief overview of what has been asked of districts. So back in early November, um, the Department of Education was trying to get a sense of really um, how many um, instructional hours students were receiving either in person or synchronously. And I think at this point, everybody in our district knows the difference between asynchronous and synchronous instruction, synchronous being where you actually have a remotely uh, a teacher leading the instruction. Uh, the data was rather um, detailed in, in, in what they were asking. So it was broken out into, um, well, first of all, it was we were only looking at four grade levels, but we were looking, we had to provide uh, data on the hybrid program uh, the remote academy, or if you had a remote program uh, in, in some other way. Also, the students who might be receiving more instructional time than uh, the typ typical student would be. So it was a rather um, significant dive into some of this data. So just for example, with the, um, the hybrid program, as everyone knows, we have the K-8, we have both a hybrid and a remote academy. So the data on both those programs was provided as well as the additional time for students. So just take the hybrid program. So we had to look at the number of in-person instructional time, in-person non-instructional time, remote synchronous time, in instructional time, remote asynchronous instructional time, and remote non-instructional time. So any kind of non-instructional time, the things that fall into that for at the elementary level, um, lunch, recess. And I think at the beginning of the year, we were finding, it's not surprising, that there was more time spent in, in having students learn the protocols of how you walk through the halls. Um, you know, the protocols of hand washing, and that was done multiple times a day. All of that, uh, which affects our data, has been uh, trimmed up since the beginning of the year. So the same, the same thing was uh, done at um, the uh, seventh grade level and then the 10th grade. Now in the chart, people who are accessing this will find that, well, where's the fourth grade data? One of the questions they ask up front is, is the amount of time in your fourth grade program similar to the time in your first grade? And the answer is yes. We have a consistent elementary program across the, the, the school system, so the answer is yes. And um, at the time, uh, districts um, were not able to review any of the, uh, the potential uh, errors or confirm or any corrections that would happen with the data. So back in December, 
so I missed this number. Uh, districts were given the opportunity to go back and, and see if there were any edit errors because one of the issues we had in the original, um, which I don't think I mentioned yesterday, is that you couldn't see your data when you entered it. You could only see the first digit of your data. So if you had four and a half hours, you could only see the four. And you didn't put decimals in. But, you, but so that was not something that could, you could prove very well. That changed by December. Um, and so, but, but also in reviewing some of the data, some of uh, Arlington's uh, did change. And that was all done in consultation with our, with our principals. So one of the report, they, they have provided a, a report in terms of uh, our instructional time. And they look at a district in terms of whether your primary um, uh, instructional model is hybrid or it's remote. Arlington is a, what they call a blended district. So we have, at the 10th grade, we all know, we have a remote program, and that has been true for the first semester. K-8 is a, um, we have both, but two thirds of our students, actually more than that, are in the hybrid program. Uh, it's more like 30% are in the remote academy. So the dominant model is hybrid. And um, I'm not quite sure how this, the hours in this new mandate were determined, but the new mandate for districts that have a hybrid predominant model is that students receive 35 hours of either in-person or synchronous instruction over a two week period. And when we looked at that, when, when our data was assessed, and I knew this up front. Well, I didn't know what the 35 hour requirement was until after the December data was submitted. Um, our elementary program has 31 hours as of November, in the early November. And I, I, I want, want to add to this is that when we did the corrections in December, we didn't change it based on what was happening in December. We, we still had to keep it what the case was in November. The long and short of it is this, the, the elementary, uh, we have 31 hours um, at the middle school, 37 hours over that two week period. And the high school, the, when we put the data in December, we were thinking about it in terms of instructional, instructional program. Uh, we, we've refined that um, a little bit more since then in terms of uh, what those hours would be. If you're a remote program, you have to have 40 hours. However, as we've been talking about tonight, the high school in a couple of weeks is going into a hybrid and the high, high school also would, would have to have 35 hours of instructional time over the two weeks. So um, as we look at the elements, so we're fine at the middle school and the high school. Uh, it's the elementary we have a focus on right now. And some of that instructional time is being, uh, has already been increased. It's not going to be, it has been just in tightening up the amount of time for non-instructional um, activities in the course of a day. So we, we are looking and have already put out a plan today to um, the, the our specialist teacher, and this will go out once they have a chance to look at this plan. Um, we will share it with um, the rest of the elementary uh, teachers as well. And the plan is that we're going to increase um, for each student an additional um, specialist class during the course of a week. So A will have an additional um, instruct, um, remote, um, specialist class on their remote day, and be the same, we'll have one. By the way, this is not measured, this is measured by cohort. In so that technically though, um, the, this gets really into the weeds, but it's actually sort of important to know that a district is 
number of hours that you need to increase is determined by a district average, not a grade level or even in this case, two grade levels. So technically we, we only need to um, provide another hour. In fact, in the report, it says we need to increase our instructional time at the elementary by 12 minutes every day. And how that translates is an hour a week for two, each week. So we have met that requirement just in terms of what we're currently doing. But one of the things that I know elementary parents have talked about is that they would like a more robust uh, remote days. About 40% of our students right now have more than morning meeting and a special. They have reading support, academic support, math support, instrumental music. Um, but that, but we need to find more for the other 60% as well. So that will be going into effect um, on Monday, January 25th. And the, the thing that was a little challenging is that we will do that and that I have to, for the district, report the data out for our two week period from uh, January 25th uh, for the next, those two weeks, the week of the 25th and the following week. Fortunately, and I say this fortunately, that those two weeks happen to be the end of the quarter because the schedule that um, parents will receive for their, their child will change in quarter three because special schedules change. Uh, but, um, and so I'm sure some of you, some people will say, well, why don't you just wait to quarter three? And uh, uh, if we're going to meet the mandate of 35 hours for, um, you know, uh, a student in the hybrid program, this is something that we need to uh, initiate sooner than just quarter three. So I know people listening are, are probably, heads are probably spinning about this. Um, and it is a little bit in the weeds, a little complicated in terms of numbers, but the, 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 the important message is that, that we are going to meet the mandate at the elementary of 35 hours of either in-person or asynchronous, I'm sorry, synchronous instruction. And we have we don't need to do anything right now at the um, either the middle school or the high school. Okay. Uh, questions? Okay. Uh, we did talk about this a lot. Was that you, Mr. Thielman? Did you no? Okay, sorry. Uh, we did talk about this a lot, um, a lot yesterday. So I appreciate the efforts that are being made to bring our synchronous learning time into compliance. Um, and so I look forward to seeing what that looks like for our kids. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is the Student Opportunity Act SOA for approval, Mr. Mason. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Let me make sure. Yes, okay. Um, first and foremost, I, I'd like to acknowledge that this plan uh, uh, has got to you later than we would like. And uh, I know it puts us in a tight spot in order to get this plan submitted to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, so with that said, the, the, the deadline uh, for the Student Opportunity Act uh, plan moved, did move several times. Um, and the, the adjustment to the um, incremental increase in state aid led to inquiries that we had sent to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed Education. We were informed earlier this week in regards to which form we should actually use uh, for Arlington Public Schools. It was also um, uncertain if uh, certain, uh, um, if the districts would be required to complete the plan at certain times because of the amount of funding that the state 
uh, that this, the state was providing um, was not really being implemented to the levels that was supposed to be implemented initially. Um, the, the Student Opportunity Act was, uh, as you may know, um, was le legislation that was established to fix the deficiencies in the, the, chap the state's uh, chapter 70 formula, uh, which was uh, established back in 1992. Um, and that the Student Opportunity Act also that was this overhaul to that formula, which made uh, some revisions to the foundation budget rates, and uh, where the Chapter 70 budget didn't uh, the formula did not keep up with the the the, the needs and the inflation uh, over time. Um, so the Student Opportunity Act was originally supposed to infuse 1.4 billion dollars in new spending for uh, education in the state over a phase uh, seven year period. And um, I'm certain that phasing has changed due to the COVID-19 pand pandemic. Um, however, uh, the, the Student Opportunity Act also requires that we come up with this, this evidence-based evidence plan that uh, we've, uh, uh, drafted and is uh, here for your review. Uh, and it's, we have to show how the district would in, intend to use the incremental increased funds that was being provided by the act. Um, however, interestingly enough, when I spoke earlier about the reasoning of why we could, didn't know how, what form to fill out was that when Desi bifurcated the process into using two different templates because about 35 districts was getting the majority of the funding, as I indicated in the memo to you. And um, Arlington was originally supposed to fill out the long form because we were in, uh, anticipating over $1.5 million of uh, incremental increase in state aid. Um, but however, um, due to the uh, pandemic that that number did change when the budget was actually approved to about 590,000, which was a big difference from the 2 million that we were originally projected to get. The SOA plan uh, that um, drafted that you see you, that we drafted includes uh, the initiatives that this committee and the school administration has already discussed throughout the, the fiscal 21 budget process. Um, all the initiatives that you see in this plan was approved and, uh, and was included in the school committee approved budget uh, for fiscal 21. Um, the initiatives in this plan um, that we've listed out does meet the $590,000 that we needed to at least identify. Um, and we also surpassed that amount in this drafted plan. I just wanted to note that I did update uh, the memo and the plan and it was updated in Novus, which is different than the one, slightly than the one that you got earlier, um, because the one thing that was not included was a, a certification statement um, about um, the certifying the, the engagement with uh, stakeholders. So I, I would like to, 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 to let you know that we did engage the stakeholders uh, and because we can certify that throughout the process, there was engagements with this school committee, uh, district administration, uh, AEA union representation with their proposals being heard throughout the, the budget process, as well as principals uh, coming to this committee, as well as consulting with their school site councils. Um, so I would say definitely that this plan was developed with the input of stakeholders. Once again, uh, sorry that we're getting this plan to you at this point in time, that gives you a limited amount of time to approve the, the SOA plan, um, but hopefully this committee can uh, take on the motion that was uh, stated in the memo and uh, approve this SOA plan in order for us to uh, certify that the school committee voted to approve this plan prior to us submitting this to meet the required deadline of the legislation. At this time, uh, we can open it up to any questions, um, but I'll yield to the chair for that. Thank you. All right, questions for Mr. Mason or Dr. Bodie on the SOA plan? 
Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to support the plan, um, uh, partly because we just got it today and, and partly because I don't believe we went through the proper process in developing the plan. Um, there is a deadline tomorrow. We do have to, we can submit the plan without um, certifying that the school committee has approved it. And it can be amended later with our, with our certification when we do approve it or when, if we change it with, with the amendments. Um, it's supposed to be a three-year plan. Uh, so using the 21 budget process as a substitute for the process to develop this plan is not sufficient. Um, you know, I do think that a lot of the stuff in there is good and that may end up being what we decide should be in the plan. But I do think that we should put some effort into developing the plan. Um, there are specific call outs to meet with special education parents and ELL parents, which we haven't done. Um, uh, and I just think I, I realize that, you know, we aren't getting the funding that we anticipated we would be getting for this. Um, so that does allow us to switch to the short form uh, and have a much lighter plan than than we were expecting. Um, but I would like to see us, uh, you know, deliberate, deliberately go through the process of developing an actual plan as, as outlined in the legislation. Thank you. Ms. Exton and then Mr. Schlickman. Um, Mr. Cardin sort of um, helped clarify some of this, but I guess so I'm, I'm still trying to understand. So these, this is for this current school year. Are we getting the 500,000 at mm -hmm. some point? Did they already give that to us? Sorry, I'm still I'm trying to sort of understand how this is all. Yeah, Playing so out. if I can answer that uh, to the chair. Uh, yes, please. So um, the funds, that 590,000 that uh, we've already received it. Not, it was an incremental increase to the, the state aid amount that was provided to the town. So fortunately that we already have a formula with the town that we use to fund the schools in Arlington. It doesn't necessarily correlate to the amount that they would get increased from the chapter 70 formula or any other adjustment to the legislation, which we're seeing with the Student Opportunity Act. So um, if, if you recall, our actual increase of the budget was like over $4 million that we got. Um, but what the original purpose of these funds was due to the change of the, the, uh, the Student Opportunity Acts was making was that we were gonna get $2 million uh, over what we got in the, from the prior chapter 70 state aid amount. And we, with getting those additional funds, the communities had to identify how they would plan to use those funds. And we had a process in which we went through to a campaign for a, an override that uh, would address and increase our budget over a, uh, a uh, multi-year period. And um, part of that process did engage the, the, the community and um, it did some of the part of the work, but this happened actually after we did that process. So um, this would call out for us to do a little bit more, more work towards that. So this, I guess I'm trying to understand. So this form that we're supposed to approve is for for last this current year that's happening. Um, yes. So budget. Okay. Yes. Correct. Okay. FY twenty one, the current one that we're right. living in right now. Yeah. Okay. And it wasn't submitted in the spring because of COVID and. The budget was up in the air and the state budget wasn't approved in the spring. Right. So okay. It was actually approved at, you know, after we were well in into the that fall, budget. really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Omer and then Mr. Thielman. Um, oh, sure. I just wanted to clarify, Mr. Cardin. I actually did meet with the CPAC last year when this was originally due. I understand your point that this is now later, but when this was originally due in the spring, I had already met with them. Um, in the winter for the special ed feedback portion. 
And what was the feedback? Um, so we gave feedback into the positions that were recommended and some of the areas um, that they thought were important. Um, I could go back to the um, minutes. I'd have to look them up, but um, we did discuss this on an agenda. Mr. Schiffman? Uh, let, me, let me call uh, I, I, bovine excrement on all of this. Uh, not directed at Arlington, but directed at the state. What has happened is, is they passed the Student Opportunity Act and said to communities who were getting significantly more money in Chapter 78 that was targeted by student demographics that they had to go and fill out a long form. And even though the communities that only got a minimal amount of Chapter 70 increases filled out the short form. Yes, we got a larger chapter 70 allocation in the initial appropriation. The additional chapter 70 money was not a part of the Student Opportunity Act funding. The additional fund, uh, chapter 70 we got was a direct result of an increase in student enrollment above uh, the amount that would trigger the cap on minimum net school spend, uh, minimum local contributions. So the state really didn't give us anything uh, under the Student Opportunity Act, but yet the state is coming along and saying, because we gave you all this extra money, we are gonna make you jump through all these hoops, fill out these reports, dot all these I's, cross all these T's. And as far as I'm concerned, whatever we put on paper, which is accurate because we did make these increases in our spending, no thanks to the state. We should just approve this thing, send it off to the state and be done with this nonsense. I would also uh, favor having a conversation with our two state reps and our state senator about the silly requirements under this act where we really didn't get any additional funding yet we have to go and do all this additional state compliance. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm voting yes on this and I wanna be done with this. Mr. Thelman. Um, I feel the same as Mr. Slickman does, but my language is not as creative and colorful as his. Uh, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, the, the idea that we, should, that we, you know, need to um, have as much dialogue as, have more dialogue and conversations about closing the academic achievement gap and continue to do that work is a, you know, very important and um, obviously we can always do more and do better, uh, but I'm not sure this particular um, motion is the place where we are gonna solve the problems uh, that, you know, that, that or the challenges that we face like many districts face. So I, I would support what Mr. Schlickman said, and that is that we dispose of this um, and that certainly uh, we, you know, have to keep and continue to address all of the questions uh, that are part of the SOA, which is which is closing academic achievement gap for students of color, low-income students, English learner, learners, and uh, students with disabilities. So that's my position on this. I'm going to, when the motion's made, I'm going to vote favorably. Anybody else? Any more comments? All right, does somebody wanna make, oh, Dr. Bodhi, go ahead, sorry. I'll just say uh, thank you. It really is a, a, a sort of, a, a, I won't say it's a formality, but it, it was very important to us to make sure that we, to, since we really didn't get the money, um, that we didn't have to fill out the long form, which is a very long process, I might add. So we can, I just want this committee to know, we can submit this tomorrow and amend it later or, or go back and you know bring this up to another school committee meeting, but we but we will submit this unless there, you see that there's any particular data that you don't remember from last year. But th these were all positions that we include in the FY21 budget, which were there mm -hmm. for the intent of the money that we really didn't get. So. Uh, and I'm not sure we're going to get any money in FY22. It's hard to say yet. 
We haven't gotten the governor's budget. Mr. Shuckman. And uh, recognizing the fact that we're accountable to, accountable to the voters and taxpayers of the town of Arlington and to our appropriating authority of the uh, Arlington town meeting, uh, who were the ones who provided the, the lion's share of the funding that enabled us to make these improvements? Uh, and that I don't want to see this again, uh, I move that the Arlington School Committee approve the in included Student Opportunity Act plan for submission to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I'll take a motion. Discussion? Uh, Ms. Exton? Um, I'm going to abstain from this since all of this seems to have been done before I was on the committee. Any more comments, questions? Okay, uh, so motion by Mr. Shipman, second by Mr. Thielman. Ms. Exton? Abstain. Mr. Cardin? No. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. All right. Um, is that all you needed, Mr. Mason, from us? Correct. For this, this section, yes. Okay. And I will say, just so that the rest of the committee knows, I didn't, I didn't know that this was coming until the end of the day yesterday either. So um, mm -hmm. definitely... These are the kind of things we want to we want to have a chance to to look at and read, especially if it requires some kind of motion for approval from us. Um, all right, uh, the FY twenty two budget priorities discussion. Um, this is something that we do as part of our budgeting process. I was looking back earlier today at the presentations that we got. Um, from the elementary and secondary principals back in December. It felt like kind of a lifetime ago, honestly. Um, so, you know, I think that the intent of this, and Dr. Allison Ampe, you may be able to speak to this um, being chair of the budget subcommittee, but is is partially for us to provide our thoughts and input into what is prioritized as part of the FY22 budget. Um, Dr. Bodie, did you wanna give any, or Mr. Mason, any sort of overall thoughts on the FY22 budget? I mean, it's it's all, you know, it's all a little up in the air right now. <laughs> so it's hard to have really, uh, I, you know, so I, I don't wanna put you on the spot too much, but do, do you want to give any kind of preamble to this discussion? Let me ask, actually, could we conflate a little bit the uh, the two agenda items um, because it does relate to this. I don't, Mr. Mason, could you talk a little bit about the um, the town budget allocation? Because Please. normally we'd be voting on that tonight. Yes, um, so I can provide you a little bit of information. Um, it's really a simple one sentence thing is that, that we do not have a number for you this evening. Um, and that is uh, because that um, after speaking with uh, Sandy Pooler, deputy town manager, um, who's been working with uh, the town manager, Adam, on trying to determine a number, uh, they, they feel that there are still questions about the number uh, uh, that would be provided for the school committee to approve. Um, and they believe that further discussion uh, needs to happen between the school committee uh, and the long range planning committee. Uh, uh, they do feel confident that uh, a discussion can be had after the governor's budget is released, um, which would be uh, on January 27th, 2021. And at that point, um, they would feel that they would have a better idea of the funding scenario um, that's provided from the governor's budget. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey, is there anything you want to share as we talk about this from a subcommittee perspective? Okay, so, um, 
I guess we'll go. I, go ahead. Yes, we can. I can't. I can't talk right now. Okay. Um, I, asked, uh, I asked Mr. Carter to speak to the budget number a bit if he wanted. Great. Go ahead, Mr. Carter. Yeah, I think I think uh, Mr. Mason just updated us on the the most recent. Um, information. We did have discussions at long range planning about um, what that number should be. There wasn't a final decision. Um, I, uh, there are two things that were open were um, the, uh, the enrollment growth, because we're not, we're not predicting any growth. We didn't get, we always, we always get the growth a year after it happens. And so we didn't have any growth. We had negative growth. Um, so they agreed not to take any money away because we had a negative number. Um, but they're not going to give us any money because we don't we didn't get any growth. So the proposal is to put some money, um, maybe the same million dollars that that was in there, for our expected growth for the growth we were expecting to have, um, which was probably at too high to begin with. But um, some number would be put a set set aside in a reserve fund in case we do get unexpected growth uh, in the fall. So um, that's still open as to what that reserve fund will look like and when we'll be able to access it and how. Um, but that would only happen if we got more than the 287 students that we lost back. Um, and then the separate issue is we agreed in the spring to cut the number in our budget um, because of the fiscal uncertainty and the likelihood of state aid cuts. Um, and the amount that we cut was from the 600,000 um, enhancement funding that was part of the five, the four year plan and the override. So the four year plan had 600,000 in the first year, 600 in the second year, 800,000 in each of the third and fourth years for enhancements and under our five year plan. Uh, and we, we basically lost 460,000 of that last spring. So the question is, is I think everybody has agreed that we will get that money at some point, but the question is whether it'll be next year spread out over two years, saved for the, the third year, or, or where that money will come in. Um, uh, Adam is releasing his budget tomorrow, I think. And so I think there's going to be some sort of suggestion in there about how he, he might want to handle that. But he, I, he hasn't communicated that to anybody, as far as I know. So that's where we are. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, are there, do people have thoughts, um, priorities, uh, suggestions, things that are important to them as we look at the budget? Yeah, we should probably go in order. Let's go in order. Um, Ms. Exton. Thanks. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I guess my first priority is that we can maintain um, what we currently have. Um, beyond that, um, you know, I, I think going into next year, um, maintaining, uh, you know, as, as small class sizes as are possible. So, you know, at all of the levels, there were reserve teachers requested. And I think um, maintaining uh, or increasing the learning community at the OMS is important, um, particularly next year. Um, after this sort of uneven school year, um, maintaining smaller class sizes, allowing teachers to develop relationships with students, um, meeting the needs of learners that you know may be struggling after the challenges that we've had. Um, I think you know we've had this plan for vice principals um, sort of rolling out, and that keeps changing. Um, I see a lot of value in, in having vice principals. They support classroom instruction. They allow administrators to hold on to meetings and um, with, with staff that, they, that can get interrupted. They support principals and educational leadership. Um, so I think in terms of really lifting the overall um, teaching that's happening in schools, I think that, that vice principals are something that we should continue to consider. Um, I've asked myself um, a lot about what's going to have a bigger impact on student learning um, in terms of what elementary principals um, requested, vice principals, a reading coordinator, more reading coaches, um, so and I would look to the administration um, and their requests in, in sort of giving us more guidance with that. 
Um, and then, you know, thinking a lot about the social emotional needs of our students going forward. So, you know, thinking about the social workers at the Gibbs um, and OMS. And I know that the high school was thinking a lot about that um, as well. So that's, those are my thoughts right now. Uh, Mr. Carden. Thanks. So I agree with Ms. Exton on, on most of her priorities, um, except for the, the principals. Um, I, I do think uh, we need to continue adding assistant principals, um, uh, but I don't think we can do it all in one year. So um, both from a budget perspective and from a you know, quality of hiring. Um, so I, I would recommend that you know, we find which of the elementary schools has the greatest need and add you know, if they wanna go towards full-time principal, assistant principals, um, you know, add to that one school uh, the two half times that we have, um, you know, I think at Dallin with an SLC program um, could definitely go up to full time. Uh, not sure it's quite needed at Hardy yet, but that's, you know, some, that kind of detail is for the administration, but I don't think we can fund all the positions this year. My priorities instead are, as Ms. Exton said, class size, keeping them uh, as low as they are, or um, in some cases, lowering them. Um, and then all the support for remedial needs, the instructional support specialists, the reading tutors, the, um, the social workers, um, and all of these, those other um, positions that were identified in, at the various levels. Um, so uh, there, yeah, so that's, that's, my, prior, that's my prioritization. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll like to, like to put the Remedial needs first, and then the administrative lead needs uh, to the extent that there's funding available. Thanks. Dr. Allison Nampi, shall I come back to you? Say yes. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Um, so I agree with uh, Ms. Exton's comments about uh, reserve teachers and Mr. Cardin's comments about reserve teachers. That's obviously a high priority. I. Um, you know, I am I'm, I am a believer in the uh, assistant principals, and um, I do believe the committee should uh, be supportive of the request of um, the principals. Uh, you know, part of the reason you have you know the hardest thing sometimes in running an organization as complex as a school, or certainly a school district, is um, is execution is sort of is getting things done operations is uh, making sure that there's uh, responses to needs of parents to making sure that that's that teachers are supported um, you, you never have enough people sometimes to bring cohesion to uh, a, a, a school with four or five hundred students in it um, you uh, <clears throat> and we lack um, enough uh, I think administrative support in those schools and I think that could put us in uh, dangerous situations at times. And so I think the fact that our principals thought deeply about the need for assistant principals and rank them number two says a lot about what they see from the vantage point of their schools, operating their schools. I mean, I think every principal would want more uh, teachers, would want smaller class sizes, more reading specialists, all the good things they need in a school. I, I, I'm sure of that. Uh, but they ranked after reserve teachers principles as their second priority. And that's from the point of view of the people running our schools, our elementary schools anyway, every day. And so I, I, have, to, I have to respect that. I can't substitute my judgment uh, for theirs. And I will tell you, when I was um, earlier in my career, on, even on the school committee, I would be the person that would advocate for fewer administrators. And then I got into administrative position myself and had to run the school and an organization, and uh, I, I appreciate the need for this kind of administrative support. So I would be supportive of it. I realize it's not the whole committee's position, but that is my position. And I'm, and I'm struck by uh, how convinced and unified the principals themselves were, and how much they uh, prioritized this need. And I'm reluctant to substitute my judgment for theirs, since they're running these schools every single day and they're in them every day and they know what the needs are of their students and their teachers. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, thank you. I think that Mr. Thielman makes an excellent argument on behalf of the assistant principals. Uh, the 
administrative workload to, to run a much larger building than, than we started out with uh, 10, 15 years ago is, is considerable. And we do need to lighten the load if we're going to be able to attract and retain principals in the district. Uh, how we move forward on that this year, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that we don't know at this point with the budget. Uh, the two things that are at the top of my mind, one are social workers in that we are going to have a lot of social emotional needs coming back and the discussion of social workers over the past month in which it turns out that they are almost exclusively dealing with special ed uh, students uh, leads me to believe that we need to uh, beef up our game in that area. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, the unknown we have on our enrollment side is how many students who would have come to kindergarten for this fiscal year are going to come to kindergarten in next fiscal year. So I would want to make sure that we have enough money set aside for an extraordinarily large kindergarten next year and make sure the resources and the uh, space uh, and, the material, and the materials for a successful kindergarten uh, are in place for next year for one that is gonna be considerably larger than we're used to having. We're gonna have a bubble coming through next year uh, is my, is my guess. So those those are my priorities: meeting kindergarten needs and uh, and getting through the uh, social emotional needs of kids coming back from the pandemic, and making sure we have enough social workers to do the job. Mr. Hainer, twenty plus years out of the classroom, I'm still looking at the world as a teacher, and uh, value all the things that teachers need. If I could write a blank, if I had a blank check, I'd, I'd get every one of the things that all my fellow members have just mentioned. Um, I think Mr. Schlickman said it, uh, we're in a unique position. We need to be able to support the mental health of not only our students, but our teachers and administrators going forward, whatever that takes. We're in a position right now that we don't know how much money we're gonna get. So maybe this question should be put on an agenda item in another two weeks when maybe the money gets a little bit better. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I wanna talk about two years ago when we tried to hire, it was either two or 2.5 FTEs of assistant principals and were unable to do so. Um, so I, given that I anticipate our FY22 budget is not what uh, we might, hope for it to be. Um, I do not want, I, I'm fine with doing some of the assistant principals for next year. I'm not okay with doing it at the, at the level that at three and a half FTEs, first of all, I think it's unrealistic to hire those people um, within one year. I don't think that we're going to get the best people. Um, and we didn't. Two years ago, we tried to get one for the Thompson. We didn't get anybody. We ended up hiring a social worker sort of in that spot, which is fine. Nobody said to have a social worker, but we still never got that position as an assistant principal. So we still don't have somebody. Um, so I just want to be realistic, given that, you know, I don't think we're going to have a ton of money to uh, to spend, um, that I want to make sure that we put in the budget a realistic FTE number for vice principal or um, for assistant principals um, and don't try to do the whole kit and caboodle this year and then find out in August that, oh, well, we couldn't do it. So we don't have these people, but we have this money that's allocated. So I want to be really realistic about it. Um, and I don't think that a, a full wholesale bring everybody to 1.0 is, is reasonable or realistic, but I'm fine with doing some of it. Um, I think that social workers are probably my number one, especially six through eight, but also nine, 12 and K-5. Uh, class sizes uh, need to be kept as small as possible. So I want to provide, um, 
you know, both Dr. Bodhi and Dr. Holman uh, in the late, I, Dr. Bodhi until, you know, the middle of the summer and then Dr. Holman in the late summer, the, uh, the flexibility to have reserve teacher positions that can be deployed as things shift and move. Um, I think Mr. Gilman's comment earlier about, you know, families looking to see what's going to happen um, and whether our schools are going to, to open for kids full time, uh, either this spring or in September is a real consideration. And I wanna make sure that, um, that our um, superintendent has the option to deploy teachers to make sure that we don't get into a really tricky situation someplace. And then I also wanna make sure that we can reasonably um, settle our contracts that are up this year in whatever way our negotiating teams um, end up sorting those out. So those are those are my priorities. All right, any other uh, feedback? Uh, yep, Dr. Allison Ampey, go ahead. Thank you, sorry. Um, so I echo much of what has been said by everyone. Um, I think my main goal is to bring to have a plan to make our schools the vibrant learning communities that we want them to be post pandemic, post disruption, um, starting in the fall, and also to address any learning gaps that have occurred over this time. Um, I agree with lower class sizes. I wonder if adding extra classroom aids, um, if we are in situations where we can't decrease class sizes past a certain point because of space constraints, if that's helpful. Um, I agree with the idea that we need to be messaging what we're going to be doing. We need to be doing that now so that because families are going to be planning for next year and they're gonna be making their decisions soon. Um, and then uh, I agree we need support for our teachers uh, and that will need support for mental health and stuff such as social workers and counselors. But the other thing that I haven't heard mentioned is whether we want to be doing anything special um, specifically to address the learning gaps which have occurred. Um, things such as extended day, summer programs, vacation programs, tutors, um, online resources, things like that. Uh, I feel like we would benefit from maybe a two-year approach to trying to get all the kids back up to where they should be. Um, and I'm hoping that we'd be able to uh, get some idea about what that would be and to see that reflected in the budget. Um, and then I also agree that we need to be thinking about our uh, negotiations that are ongoing and that we want to do um, the best job with those that we can. That's all. Great, thank you. Any other follow-up from anybody? Okay, and then, uh, so we will not be voting tonight on an FY22 uh, town budget allocation because we don't have a number, but I think it's, you know, I think it's nice to, to see that on the agenda just because you know that in a different year we would have been doing that likely. Um, okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is prioritization of teacher vaccinations, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Um, the governors uh, and everyone else seems to have a priority of getting kids back into school full time. I think the pri I think it would be most important for this committee to uh, seek help with MASC and other organizations to lobby uh, the uh, governor to get Jesse and everything to move the teachers up in priority for vaccination. They are on tier two. I'm on tier two by virtue of my age. Uh, I think. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I think teachers should be on a higher priority to get them back and feel comfortable. So uh, uh, I'd like to open for discussion and possibly uh, a motion to uh, request uh, the chair seek uh, MASC uh, to lobby for us going forward. Thank you. Discussion? Mr. Cardin? Um, so, I, I mean, 
I think uh, they are pretty high in the in the in the order now. They they're on second level of phase two, and and hopefully we'll be getting enough supplies that they can proceed with both the first level and the second level uh, around the same time. But that that's sort of where I would would uh, direct our efforts is not necessarily changing the priority order because that requires the advisory committee and other other work um, to go on, but encouraging them to move into both both uh, the the two the two top tiers in phase two at the same time, so that you know our health department can be our our, our school nurses can be vaccinating our teachers while our health department is organizing clinics for the elderly. Mr. Schickman? Uh, I thank um, Mr. Hainer for bringing this up. Um, I think that communicating to our representatives uh, and our Senator and the governor and to MASC and also to uh, other school committees through the uh, MASC listserv or uh, other means possible would be a good thing to do with a message that's basically, uh, I don't know if the message is to facilitate moving up in the uh, tiers, but to uh, urge a timely um, and expedited uh, allocation of vaccine uh, as well as the mechanism for uh, for for providing it to our teachers, so where where we are in the priorities is one thing is do will we be able to get that in the arms of our teachers uh, on a reasonable uh, on a reasonable basis? Uh, I don't want our teachers jumping through hoops. I'd like to uh, see something like we did this week with uh, uh, first responders and and making it easy for it to happen. So. Uh, I would, and, and I'm crafting a motion in my head as we're moving forward, I move that the Arlington School Committee uh, to direct the chair to communicate to our elected state representatives, our state senator, the governor, and to MASC, uh, our desire for uh, 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 providing uh, vaccinations for our profession, uh, for our, for our school-based staff, as soon as possible, and providing uh, uh, support for uh, the logistics of accomplishing uh, the vaccinations. Second. Discussion. Okie doke. Uh, Ms. Exton, let's vote. Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I'm going to abstain from this one. Um, not that I don't support it. Um, all right. That's because we're making you work. <laughs> You know, um, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, Dr. Bodie. Uh, on mute. Uh, what's on the agenda as always is the update on the high school. And really the update at this time is um, something everybody can see, which is the work that's going on. Uh, we have a bird's eye view on the sixth floor. We also have uh, we also have noise of, the, of the, the construction, but it is going along very well. It is on time. Um, they, you can see the steel going up. I think one of the things that was a big surprise to us is how quickly they put in the staircases uh, the other day. And uh, what you're already seeing is the, the east part of the steam wing being um, uh, enclosed. The idea was to get the building as closed as soon as possible so that the interior work can begin in a more protected environment. So it's going along quite well. Um, the subcommittee work that, that's um, part of 
the work that has to be done, it, again, is moving forward. We had, uh, we have now moved to monthly meetings uh, for the, um, for the for the building committee for the for the foreseeable future anyway, and continuously um, I, I compliments to Dr. Allison Ampey and Amy Spear who keeps the communication um, continuing to be updated, and so there's going to be um, some new information on the website very soon. And I, and I do remind people that if you would like to have. Uh, the you know notification sent to you, you can go on uh, uh, the the building website ahsbuilding.org. All right. Um, so anyway, that's really all there is at the moment. Um, I hope to have you have more update from the subcommittees uh, maybe the next time we meet. And that's all I have for the superintendent's report. Great. Uh, the consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no, <coughs> excuse me, separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the event will be, the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Um, Mr. Hainer contacted me earlier about the minutes from the December 17th meeting. Um, so let's pull those and then we can administratively change them and I think approve them tonight. So I'm going to pull those if I'm allowed to do that. I don't know. All right, great. So uh, war uh, vote approval of warrant 21140, check date 122920. Can I get a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, and for the minutes, um, Ms. Fitzgerald, I believe the December 17th meeting, um, Mr. Hainer's name is missing from the attendees list. So if we can make that change um, administratively, that would be great. And then um, we can approve the minutes separately. If anybody, does anybody have a problem with that? No. Okay, so I need a motion to approve the minutes from um, the regular meeting December 10th and December 17th with the change to the December 17th, 2020 meeting. Minutes. No move is amended. Um, great, and you seconded Mr. Thielman, thank you. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Al Snampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Uh, subcommittee and liaison reports uh, budget. Dr. Allison Ampey. We met, um, I'm getting my meetings confused. We met before Long Range Plan and we'll meet again over, we, we met discussing things that would come up at Long Range Plan and we will be meeting over the next couple of weeks um, in preparation for the meeting on the 5th and also to start, continue the budget process. Uh, community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, we had our first uh, scheduled meeting last uh, Saturday, Mr. Thielman and I didn't have a lot of people come out, but a couple came in and occupied us for a good hour. Uh, some good discussions that uh, were reflected in tonight's meeting. Uh, they will continue uh, on a weekly basis uh, for the next 20 weeks. Uh, CIA, Mr. Cardin. Uh, yes, yeah, so as we discussed, we met yesterday to go over the student learning time report and new regulations. Um, we'll be meeting again, uh, probably not until after our next meeting. Uh, to go over, uh, to go back with the Human Rights Commission on the uh, issues they raised over the summer, uh, one of which uh, we had told them we were doing the climate survey, and I understand we'll be getting results of the climate survey at our next meeting, so we can discuss that further in subcommittee after the next meeting, if that is confirmed. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was going to talk about that on the future agenda items, um, but that's something that I have on the agenda for the meeting in two weeks time are the, um, the panorama survey results. So if there's any reason that that's not gonna happen, then somebody needs to let me know. Uh, 
<laughs> All right, uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policy, Mr. Schuchman. Yeah, we're going to need to schedule a meeting. Uh, Dr. McNeil sent uh, an email to me saying that we need to look at our restraint policy to uh, comply with uh, current guidelines based on the tiered focus monitoring review. Uh, and we also want to take a look at the uh, Native American imagery. So uh, when I get the background information over the policy changes and some uh, availability of the student, uh, I'll poll the rest of the subcommittee for a meeting. And um, Mr. Schlickman, just a clarification on that. I think the piece we we did the um, we did the seal. It's the um, it's the land use piece. Right? Isn't it? Is that? Um... Yes, yes, yes. I don't want to talk the whole thing out, but uh, the the land the, the policy uh, statements uh, surrounding her presentation, which are definitely go into the land use uh, discussion. Great, thank you, uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet next on February second. I think Dr. Bodie summarized where we're at. Great liaison reports. Announcements, future agenda items, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, just on the announcements or the comments, uh, uh, with regard to the building, the high school building, somebody's been posting some drone shots of the high school building uh, on Facebook. And I just wanna say that, yes, uh, I agree that the progress being made right now in the high school project is astounding and I want to thank uh, the folks who were involved with the project for their diligent work. Great. Um, announce, so liaison reports, announcements, future agenda items. Mr. Thielman. I had a question and it maybe I, I lost the plot here. Um, we had a, there was a survey that went on to parents at some point in November. And I, I don't believe we ever got the results back and discussed them. Correct. Uh, so that's the panorama survey that Ms. Panorama survey. mentioned, okay. and okay. I also mentioned. And um, my understanding is is that uh, that a representative of the superintendent, likely uh, Dr. McNeil, but I don't want to I don't want to put him on the spot too much, will be uh, sharing that with us at our next meeting. Panorama. Okay. I, we can call it whatever. It's a climate no, survey. I, I, we call I lots of different things. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Dr. McNeil, does that does that line up with your expectation? Um, so there are some things that we're working with Panorama. They're, they're coming in and they're doing a presentation to all the administrators um, in order to uh, talk about the dashboard and the, and the results. So I am looking to have that presentation on the first meeting in February. Um, we also are planning on sending out the student survey around that time, uh, the first February 1st and February as well. So I'm sorry, February 1st, I said that twice. I didn't mean to say that, but February 1st, we're planning on sending out the student survey and have the students respond to that. So we are planning, I would like to have that presentation on the first meeting uh, of February for school committee. Okay, well, the challenge, so you're, so what you're saying is, is that you're not going to be ready for, for January 28th. Um, my calendar might be wrong, but I don't see us, maybe I haven't even put these in. That's possible. All right. Okay, so whatever, we must have a meeting in February. I just don't have it on my calendar, which is fine. Um, uh, I can check with Karen for the yeah. dates for the um, February 11th. February 11th. February 11th. Okay. So if that's okay with the committee, I would definitely request that. However, if you, you know, again, it's up to you. If you would like it on January 28th, I, I could probably try to do that. But I just feel that we will be um, very prepared on February 11th to give you the results. Okay. I think my concern is just that the data is getting older and older by the day. And we did this survey um, when I, you know, I think back to our December meeting and that feels like a lifetime ago to me. So I'm disappointed that um, we have not gotten any readout from it um, to date. 
So, I mean, if it's not ready for the 28th, it's not ready and we'll do it on the 11th. I, but I, my personal opinion is that I'm disappointed that we haven't seen anything from it. And I think that it gets older and staler by the day. Um, so that's the answer to your question, Mr. Thielman, February 11th. Thank All right, um, anybody else? Okay, uh, executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union mm -hmm. if which held an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. I get a motion. So move. So moved, specifying that it's with the AEA, the negotiation is the discussion is about the negotiation with the AEA. Thank yep. you. Um, so uh, motion by Mr. Hayner, second by Mr. Cardin um, for executive session, Ms. Exton. Oh, and we are going to adjourn from executive session. We will not be coming back. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Alice Nampi? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I am also yes. All right. Thank you to everybody else. Well. <laughs>